SeatGeek is the easiest way to find the best deals on tickets to pretty much any live event. Concerts, sports, theater, comedy, whatever you want. SeatGeek searches multiple ticket sites and compares prices for you, so you can save time and money. Plus, their mobile app is ridiculously easy to use. Download the SeatGeek app today and enter promo code SEATS to save $20 on your first purchase. That's promo code SEATS for $20 off. SeatGeek. Right seat, right now, right from your phone. Which he somehow didn't expect in this yeah, game. Yeah, right? Just, what the he's hell? He's rolling through these people and he's like, oh, you're poor and I'm not. Oh, I want to fuck a child. Oh, <laughs> what's going on? And then they're like, oh, we're going to fight you. And he's like, holy shit, they can see me? <laughs> Eli, cautionary tale. Cautionary tale, Eli. This is what happens when you go around saying you want to fuck a child. Take this to heart. This is why we're not allowed to be in parades. <laughs> this is the ghost of, uh, of Christmas future for you, Eli. Just be aware of these things. God awful movie. 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 Welcome back to the Gamcast, where each week we sample another selection from Christian cinema because at a certain level of immorality, even atheists have sins to atone for. I'm your host, No Illusions, and sitting to my immediate left is an empty chair. Heath wasn't able to join us this week, but not to worry. Eli shaved his head, so we still meet our hairless guy minimum. I look <laughs> Not a good look. Sort of an Adams family peripheral member kind of a look. Yeah. Uh, speaking of which, I might as well introduce you. Sitting 81 miles to my right is my bad friend, Eli Bosnick. Eli, how are you this fine afternoon, sir? I don't believe it's sick. <laughs> Better than I look. You know? <laughs> Better than I look. Or am I? Sorry, I'm just getting in the spirit of this movie. Getting in the spirit. <laughs> well done, sir. Well done. And filling at least some portion of Heath's enormous shoes this week, sitting five hours to my future as full-time skeptical activist and part-time cinematic masochist Michael Marshall. Marsh is the project director for the Good Thinking Society. He's a freelance journalist and author, a blogger, co-host of the Skeptics with a K podcast, and ever so infrequently the host of Be Reasonable Marsh. Welcome back, my friend. Thanks a lot, Noah. Uh, you know who's running jokes I'm going to struggle to pick up this week? That'd be Heath. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you just have to pretend to be racist and you're most of the way there. Right. Um, <laughs> see, see, Heath, I said pretend. I pretend. said pretend. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How old's that wife of yours? So... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'm not going to be baited into answering that question. We've been married a couple of years now. I'm well aware that that's a, that's a, a bear pit to fall into. Yeah. yeah. For yeah. all kinds of good reasons. Um, so now I, I should also mention, uh, Marsh, you're one of the organizers of the premier skeptical conference in the world, QED, uh, an annual conference in Manchester, England. Are you guys uh, doing that again this year? We are, we are. We're deep in the middle of planning it all now and, and tickets are all on sale. That's going to be um, October 14th and 15th. Uh, and it's going to be at least as good as the time that you guys were there. Uh, we've got the podcast room. We don't have uh, a lot of Americans coming in to colonize the podcast room. So we've got to actually figure out how to <laughs> fill that room for ourselves, which is a novel, uh, a novel problem to have when we didn't think about it previously because we had three podcasters, three podcasts already just turning up. So, um, yeah, we've got lots of different uh, interesting questions to figure out, but we'll definitely have them figured out by October, which is why everyone should buy tickets to QBD. Yeah, I'll tell you what, it's one of those conferences that I would go ahead and pick up my tickets for before you announce a single speaker because I just know what a good job you guys are going to do with it. I, I, I say that, you know, even when you're not on the show. Um, and for those of you who have, have been to a skeptical conference or two, if you haven't been to QED, you don't know how good it can get. I, I, I say that from the bottom of my heart. So now that we're done with all that plug and stuff, uh, tell us, Marsh, what are we going to be breaking down today? Okay, we're going to be breaking down Six The Mark Unleashed. The uh, prison breakout drama starring Stephen Baldwin and exposing me for the first ever time to the talents of David A.R. White. I've never seen this guy before. I know you guys are big fans. Possibly you've seen more of his films than any member of his immediate family have actually seen. <laughs> but this was my, uh, my David A.R. White debut. And uh, I've got to say, it did not let me down. <laughs> it sure doesn't. <laughs> so, uh, no, no, it's great. We busted your white chair. You'll always remember us now. And Eli... How bad was this movie? Oh, well, if you want to see Negan get his due, and someone once described an M. Night Shyamalan twist to you, but you don't 
like sweary words. You, <laughs> you will love this movie. This, this movie is the worst put together thing I've ever seen. Oh. And I've been to Detroit. I've seen buildings <laughs> in Detroit. And I, and now I can just hold up copies of this movie and be like, yeah, but I mean, this movie though. <laughs> Well, that's what I, as I'm watching this, I'm thinking, fuck, we talked Marsh into this. He works for the, for the good thinking. Does, does, does this tarnish your standing in the good thinking society? The fact that you voluntarily watched a David A.R. White movie? And if not, why not? Well, I think it doesn't, but I think that's because part of my job is to intentionally expose myself to things that are terrible. So I've been to see Peter Popov. I've been to homeopaths. <laughs> I've had all sorts of crazy different treatments uh, done on me. So I'm kind of a professional masochist when it comes to skeptical stuff. So this fits perfectly in with the job remit. I love, too, that so many of these Christian movies want to take place in prisons, even though they can't swear. It's amazing. <laughs> Why do they do this to themselves? Fooey, I say. Fooey, I'm in here for the murder. <laughs> now, is there anything you guys want to nominate this one for being the best at being the worst at? Yeah, I, I want to say this has the best worst piercing of any film I've ever seen. Uh -huh. It's got It's like 105 minutes long, but literally nothing happens until the last 20 minutes. Uh, I think this is kind of the movie equivalent of, you know, when you go to write a sign on a piece of paper, like a, a protest sign, something like that, or a sign you're going to stick up in the, the refrigerator <laughs> yes. at work. And then you start writing in nice big letters so everyone can see it. And then pretty soon you realize that you're running out of space and you've got to start <laughs> writing smaller and smaller and kind of curl the line down. That's what this is. This is one of those signs, the movie. <laughs> <laughs> well said, sir. Eli, oh. got any uh, best worsts? Uh, I got to give this best worst torture. So obviously they couldn't just, you know, have anybody being tortured here. So what they decided was um, Wonder Woman bracelets that <laughs> simulate torture. We're, we're going to get to it. But the descriptions of some of the torture in this movie are <laughs> phenomenal. Yeah, they have a torture matrix type device that doesn't touch your head. It's really, it's it's really quite nice. I mean, it, it doesn't touch your head, but if you look really carefully, the electrodes are actually attached to his armpits. I don't know if you noticed that, but he has, <laughs> he's got electrodes just underneath the armpits, so he's they're, they're torturing him through the armpit nerves. It's it's astonishing it's technology. A lymph node type thing. Go. I have. Yeah. Right. Right. Okay. All right. Well, there's an awful lot of nothing just waiting to burst out of this movie, so we'll keep the break brief, and when we come back, we'll dive into all the apocalypse smack and goodness that is six the mark unleashed with no punctuation so what the fuck am i supposed to do with that honestly <laughs> hey folks we know we usually do our ads as little skits and sketches to keep things fun and interesting and don't get me wrong i like carl the pug of peg of corn as much as the rest of you but we wanted to take a second to break that pattern and tell you that not only are we happy to advertise for blue apron but we're happy to use it as well that's right noah Way before they paid us to say nice things about them, both Heath and myself were customers of Blue Apron because, and this probably won't surprise you, when you collectively spend around 100 hours a week on a podcast, cooking kind of goes out the window. So if you're like us and you want to skip the hassle of the grocery store and have fresh, pre-proportioned ingredients with easy-to-follow recipes delivered right to your door, check out this week's menu and get your first three meals free with free shipping by going to blueapron.com slash godawfulmovies. You will love how good it feels and tastes to create incredible home-cooked meals with Blue Apron. So don't wait. That's BlueApron.com slash godawfulmovies. Blue Apron, a better way to cook. Oh, man, sure I'm glad we didn't take the mark. Now we live with Jesus on these thrones and we'll rule for a thousand years. Yeah! Woo! Okay. Animal, vegetable, or mineral? Um, ve vegetable, a again. Woo! You know, a throne gets... Gets uncomfortable after a couple hundred years? Yes, thank you, I've noticed! Woo! All right, gentlemen, uh, time's up. I'm sorry, what? Yeah, no, your contract was very clear. You'd rule beside Christ on golden thrones for... A thousand years. Oh, uh, uh, oh, well, okay, but uh, w what do we do now? Um, I don't know. I mean, what are your job qualifications? Well, we rule. Rule, rule with Christ for I... thousands of years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, I mean, all this is getting knocked down to make a mall, so I guess you could see if they need any 
rulers. Woo. <laughs> <laughs> and we're back for the breakdown. And before the credits are even fully underway, I had to stop to marvel at how many awesome ideas Christians seem to have for different 666 tattoos. This, this new one might, might be my favorite, the little three, the triangle-y one that they have for this one. But every Apocalypse movie has a new, cooler version of the 666 tat. It's true. It's true. I like it. Also, we should point out that this movie was uh, made by ChristianCinema.com. And I just want to say, websites, you make the best movies. <laughs> <laughs> and Godwin. Yep. <laughs> We immediately start seeing Nazis. That's the first image that we see. 666 and then Nazis. Yep. Hitler lies. Lenin lies. Well, yeah, right. And God is the opiate of the masses win as well. <laughs> but I love these quotes that they put up because they put up the quote from Lenin and to show, show, show all about kind of truth and stuff like that. And said, the lie told often enough becomes the truth, which Lenin never said. There's no evidence. Lenin <laughs> It's just that everyone has said Lenin said that for so, much, for so often that now everyone thinks Lenin said it. It's just an amazing, lovely irony. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and of course, we've got the uh, words of Pontius Pilate caught on film, of course. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes. Pontius Pilate, what is truth? Uh, I also had uh, what is love, baby, don't hurt me. That was Hadaway. Uh, that's the only <laughs> thing I could think when I saw what is truth. <laughs> God, I want to go in there and splice that into the movie. They wouldn't know this. <laughs> the Christians would be like, no, what is it? It it does hurt you, though, sometimes. <laughs> so the credits wrap, and then we get uh, Davy White monologuing over the sight of a bunch of prisoners. Yeah. I still remember Saturday morning cartoons. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, right. That's the kind of shit you're reduced to when you can't just admit you miss blowjobs and anal beads in your movie, though, right? <laughs> he, he, one of the things I love is he says uh, he remembers the Gulf War. Uh, the the second Great Depression, school shootings, and the music. And then he says, it's the music that I miss most. Because that would have been weird. <laughs> it would have been weird if he was like saying it was like the school shootings he missed most. He was like, I'm just really nostalgic for Columbine. <laughs> of those four things, though, the one if I could only have one of them back, it would be the Great Depression. You know, uh, you know that one, yeah. I love the struts, but I also love it when school bullies get their own. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, okay, and so while this is happening, there is a, a stunning woman on a TV screen explaining to all of these prisoners that monogamy has been eliminated. Oh, I, oh no. I like this world. Monogamy. Yeah, <laughs> like this the scary thing that we're this is the introduced the post apocalyptic terrible world and she's like sexual jealousy's been eliminated, you can fuck whoever you want. And we as the audience are supposed to be like <laughs> Yeah, we're, we're supposed to be rooting for jealousy rage and sexual possessiveness. Yeah. Like, oh my god, no, I can't believe they got rid of these core values of rage and jealousy. She also gives everybody permission to be gay, which was no. nice. No. She, does. <laughs> she also she says that we've got this uh, implant. I, I like this this girl. She she kind of she's talking like a sort of sexy Siri, and mm. she's pretty foxy. She's quite a foxy oh, floating yeah. head on that screen. And then she <laughs> says that uh, you've got everyone gets this implant, which makes us part of the collective whole. And I'm pretty sure collective whole was her nickname at college. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, and as we're going to learn, group sex is a big part of the post apocalyptic world, and. Uh, yeah, it's a possibility. I'm just saying it's a possibility. <laughs> yeah, and I, I looked I looked this actress up who played uh, Sexy Siri, because I was just looking through the cast to see if there's anything interesting there. It turns out she was actually a softcore porn star, a legit porn star. She was called uh, Sung Hai Lee. And if you look through her pictures, she does not need an implant. I can tell you that right now. She needs no <laughs> implants, that girl. You've never made me so happy. You never <laughs> made me so happy, Mark. She, she's not the only uh, former softcore porn star that we'll meet in this movie, actually. So, uh, you know. I'm so happy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. the best movie ever. So, okay, Jamie, get yeah, ready. One. Jamie, you've got your work cut out for you on this. Is that your way of explaining to me some other parts of D David A.R. White's back uh, catalog? Because <laughs> I haven't seen his back catalog to this point. <laughs> it's actually called Back Catalog, so fun fact. <laughs> <laughs> well done, sir. Oh, also, by the way, the implant makes you live for 200 years. Not only does it get rid of all the sexual jealousy and allow you super gayness powers, but it also lets you live for 200 years and access birth control. No. No. 
<laughs> but I, I love when yeah. they say the 200 years part in this film because you kind of you go along the kind of the lineup of uh, of prisoners who were there and they're talking about like 200 years guilt free sex shag anyone you want absolutely fine and everyone's kind of happy and it gets right <laughs> to the end and there's this fat guy with kind of like bad hair and a neck beard and he looks super depressed and I'm pretty sure that's because he's thinking yeah 200 years. I'm not going to be fucking for 200 years. Let's face it, my 200 years is not going to be fuck filled. Yeah, yeah, no, we've still got eyes in the future. Yeah. <laughs> um, but your World but... of Warcraft account is going to get really, really up there <laughs> over the next 199 years. It's, it's, it's not all good news in the future, though. It's not all good news because they have said that uh, as well as all this kind of lovely, kind of wonderful sex cut stuff, there's some bad stuff. There were purges. Apparently 80 million people died in one day. Um, which I guess happened, and I bet they still refused to have a, deb- a debate about gun control at that point. <laughs> they still, still win because guns don't kill people. Well, totalitar- totalitarian leaders committing great purges kill people. If those 80 million people had had guns. Yeah. <laughs> Come Just on. Stephen yeah. King sitting on a mountain of bodies. I Honestly, we don't have the data at this point to really <laughs> stop grabbing at me. Go into the light. <laughs> oh no our softball game <laughs> oh jesus um, i also love to that right on the heels of them saying like now you can learn to do anything in the world you can have any job instantly you can have the knowledge I- at the same time davy is having his little monologue and he's going like i remember my old job i was a car test driver engineer thing yeah like his, job. his job he was a designer an engineer and test driver for chevrolet what? I'm pretty sure those are three different jobs. Chevrolet can afford to hire more than one guy to do all of their jobs. (laughs) All right, get in. I I feel like I should still be... No, get in. We want to make sure it's good. Like, imagine that you use the engineer who knows everything about the car. You use that guy as the test driver. Like, right, now I've designed this car. I might as well figure out if it's safe. If it's not, there's no one who knows how this works. (laughs) I really usually just do the clay models. Yeah, I'm just, <laughs> I'm that guy. Yeah, right, right. Apparently they seem to think that that's one, there's an office at the bottom of Chevrolet or something like that where that guy works. So now we get a flashback. We will rejoin this scene at the end of the movie long after you've forgotten about it. So we get a flashback and Davey is uh, with his buddy in a car listening to an Antichrist pep talk on the radio in this flashback. Uh, this would be red-haired Matt Stone in my notes. Okay. All right. No, that's fair. See, I think in this scene, and I'll, I'll come back to this several times, I didn't have him down as a red-haired guy nope. in this scene, and that will become important for me progressively <laughs> as this uh, as this goes on. So they're jamming along with uh, with their sweet, sweet Antichrist propaganda, and uh, you know, speaking almost directly in exposition at this point david r white's like oh man you don't know i was in la during the purges yeah but i mean given that he's talking about purging in la i just assumed he was talking about bulimia i didn't assume it was <laughs> <laughs> so they get a quick little bit of exposition there while they're listening to the antichrist on the radio and then it's time to head into apparently they're car thieves right so they're they're breaking into this building because, you know, when you want to steal a car, you have to go to the building with the car in it. That's usually the, the easiest way to get a car is to break into a high school. Anyway, <laughs> so as they're going in, they, I, I love, too, that the, the later to be redhead in the film. I'm with you, by the way, on this, Marsh. We'll, 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 we'll commiserate <laughs> as we go. Um, he's the, He has to say, like, why? I'm the hacker character. I can computer up anything. That sure will come in handy later in the movie. Look at me. <laughs> yeah, and so they they hack in to get this Porsche, right? They steal mm-hmm. a Porsche, but are are Porsches illegal in the future? I, I don't. I feel like we should get Nick Cage for this. By the way, I feel like if we were going to do this <laughs> scene, goddamn it, it shouldn't have been David A. R. White. We should have got Nick Cage. He was available. He'd have done it. I mean, can we talk for a second about how they get into the building as well? Because his friend is the hacker who hands him this swipey thing. We don't really get to see it. It's just in a wallet with like an American flag and a UFO on it. And then David <laughs> R. White swipes the swipey thing against the kind of the uh, the control for the gate. But if you look at the control for the gate, it looks exactly like one of those things where you kind of pull up in your car and press in a pin code. And it looks like he just touches the swipey thing to the outside yeah. of that pin code thing. So he's like just <laughs> tapping it against the metal and whatever miracle his friend has worked opens that. 
And then he also <laughs> opens like the actual roller where the Porsche is with the same swipey thing. And it's like in the future, everything is controlled with exactly the same security system that's hackable by one swipey thing. And this happens later on as well. It's like yep. the future, we've forgotten all of kind of InfoSec. It's just one key opens <laughs> all locks. This is much simpler. Well, Marsh, you're not you're forgetting that this is the evil future and nothing is more evil than everything being chip and pin in the future. So <laughs> you gotta remember <laughs> No sir, you gotta insert your card. Why? It was so much quicker when we just no, sir, sir, <laughs> insert it, leave it there. All right, now go get a sandwich because it has to stay there for literally ever, sir. Now so, enter yeah. your pin. <laughs> So then, then he gets in to, to, to steal this Porsche, right? And what I like is the way he touches this car and the way he stares at this car, I just thought he had an implant that makes him want to fuck cars. That's what his <laughs> implant does because he's really into this car. I would have fucked that car. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So he breaks in and, of course, he uses the, uh, the, the time-tested technique of just opening the door. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't locked. It wasn't locked. It's behind a keypad. It's behind a roll of a, a doll with a keypad to it. Once you get in, don't bother locking the car. Yeah, no. why, why would you need to bother at that point? It's well and truly secure. <laughs> apparently, yeah, exactly. Um, so yeah, so he starts it. Uh, apparently, it's got one of the quick hot wire access panels that all cars and movies seem to have. Yeah, you just you lean down, you find the on switch that's just hidden <laughs> just below the uh, the steering wheel. Press that. You're away. Two seconds done. Well, at least they didn't have the keys in the uh, in the visor there. At least they didn't go there. <laughs> um, so he starts the car, and of course the Antichrist is on the radio saying, "Like you can become a god like me, you know, for five easy payments." Of- <laughs> well, that's what they were going for there. But yeah, so he he drives away uh, to make his escape. And now we cut to Eric Roberts sitting in a dark bar. And I thought, (laughs) oh, guys, you accidentally caught some B footage and put it in the movie. Just (laughs) him shouting, you don't know. You don't know. I was in real movies, damn it. It's okay. Keep this. We'll just get rid of the audio. (laughs) (laughs) That would explain a lot. Yeah. So he's hiding in a diner after dark or whatever. And, and he gets up and he's looking out the window or whatever. And then all of a sudden there's another guy who's also there. I am dying to know how this comes about, right? <laughs> yeah. That yeah. These like two guys are sitting in a dark. Yes. Right. <laughs> Thing is, it's not even that dark a room because there's loads of light on Eric Roberts. So this guy yeah. is just in a black hole in the corner of the room. <laughs> and just sort of like jumps out of it like some sort of fucking portal or something. <laughs> Super awkward as he army crawls into the room. Eric Roberts <laughs> sees him and he's just like, I'll let him do his thing. He wants to do the <laughs> cigarette thing. I don't want to ruin his. He's been doing to that appear. for a while. You know, I know how he is. Like He likes to appear. <laughs> yeah so okay so god knows it, like i'm gonna go ahead and tell you that these two characters are uh, the, the the one character is negan and he is going to be the smuggler who will be the hero of this movie basically and the other guy is eric roberts who will be dead by the end of this scene and it doesn't fucking matter because they could really only afford these four minutes with eric roberts <laughs> yep Uh, But we do establish something very important here that will ruin the rest of the movie if they don't establish it. They can't just punch the mark into you because if you don't take it willingly, it kills you. Why? Go fuck yourself. But that is a rule that they establish early on, which makes a lot of sense because the rest of the movie will be, take the mark, no, take the mark, no. I don't want to live 200 years and fuck a lot. <laughs> well, yeah, we also find out why, our because obviously we need our characters to not have the mark, but they also aren't Christians at this point because we need this to be a Christian conversion kind of film. So we've got why uh, the Negan fella, who I thought looks like a Betamax version of Javier Bardem. Uh, at time. He's got like <laughs> okay. a Bardem kind of thing going on, but like a sort of slightly cheap ripoff. He looks like um, <laughs> if you got a Chinese factory made doll of Javier Bardem. So it's, <laughs> it's close but it's not quite Javier Bardem. That's what he kind of looks like to me. Um, Eli, so he, you have a Chinese-made doll of Javier Bardem. Is that is that accurate? I do. I mean, I would need to see the holes in it to really tell you. <laughs> there was a sharpness problem. I don't want to get yeah. into it. We'll also come back to his holes at some point soon as well. Um, <laughs> say, oh, yes, we will. But yeah, so we've got him explaining why he doesn't have the chip. And he says, uh, I'm scared of being one of those brain dead morons who thinks about nothing all day, but worshipping that psychotic dictator who claims he's God. 
says this Christian movie. Yes. <laughs> it's a stunning lack of self-awareness. Oh, yeah, no, there will claims. be several. This will not be the last time in this movie that it is pointed out, hey, isn't the leader just like the Christian God? <laughs> and everyone in the movie is like, no, just come on, man, jingly to the keys. They're so jingly. Stop it. Well, but their <laughs> argument against that it consistently is, no, 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 but we're right, though. Yep. That's yeah, the, yeah, di- that's yeah, that's the exactly difference, it. though, is that we're correct. <laughs> Yeah, that's their entire fucking argument. So, yeah, basically, but what we've got here is we've got two guys that are involved in the underground smuggling of things like tobacco, apparently, or whatever. And they've had it with this apocalypse. So, but I guess um, Eric Roberts is the one running the store and Negan is the guy selling the stuff. So he takes him in the back to show him his his good stuff, which apparently includes a lot of cigars and banned DVDs. Banned DVDs. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, do we know why they've banned cigars and tobacco, though? Because they have this society where it's a complete kind of free uto- a sexual utopia. It seems Hedonistic weird that they're also and, like, yeah, yeah, fuck anyone you like, but don't smoke, guys. <laughs> Whether they're just kind of like really worried about like lung cancer, I, I don't know. I mean, fair play if they've got a good public health uh, measure uh, going on, but it seems a bit extreme. Yet another reason to love this apocalypse, you know, like <laughs> yeah. I, I would probably quit if it was just the shit was illegal. Yeah, and if and if you would quit if you got to live to two hundred and fuck anyone well, you like, I'm pretty yeah. sure you give up the cigarettes. As a yeah, this is worth it. This is worth it. This is a, a fair exchange at this point. Exactly. See, yeah. When they announced that tobacco was illegal, I had an image in my mind of like Noah Waiton camped out all night to get his mark, and they're like, right. So just quick <laughs> rules: tobacco is banned. You're all gonna live two hundred. Noah's just packing up his shit. Motherfuckers need to tell people the rules. <laughs> Been here since Thursday to get my eye mark. And fucking, nope, I choose. My Marlboro, but we'll cut your head off. Yeah, come get me, motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> well, that would be my first reaction, but ultimately I'd come around. I also love the uh, the movies they chose to, he's like, oh, I got some great band DVDs. And here's the movies they chose to list. Um, Schindler's List and Braveheart. Yeah, I, I think it's brave to go from Schindler's List to a Mel Gibson film. Oh, it's kind right? of like saying, hey guys, you know, let's just hear both sides of the story. I'm a skeptic. <laughs> hear me out. <laughs> Uh, but yes and then all the gi joe extras show up (laughs) by the way i want to point this out the wardrobing in this movie is goddamn ridiculous and andrea logan white is listed uh under wardrobing in the uh in the credits amazing amazing she's just sitting there in her director's chair everyone gets a black turtleneck (laughs) Well, hun, don't you think everyone? <laughs> the black turtleneck budget for this movie much, much, much higher than the acting budget. <laughs> so yeah, so all of a sudden the bad guys show up to arrest them or whatever, and apparently yeah, how one did they of- get in? How did I they get in? Like we've got Javi Bardem making his way in. We've got these bad. Does Eric Roberts not lock the door of his hideout? This is basic hideout one hundred and one. <laughs> Come on, people. And one of the cops is Negan's ex-wife. I have this actress down as Carrie Ann Fungus. Yes, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. But uh, but she is apparently like one of the bad guy leaders. Um, so they grab Eric Roberts, drag him out. And here's the thing. This is not supposed to be a comedy moment. They drag Eric Roberts outside and Negan goes, what are you going to do with Dallas? Bam, bam, bam. They shoot him like in comedic timing. And he's just like, <laughs> it, it's fucking laugh out loud. It's incredible. And I, I really wanted that to just carry on like some sort of slapstick scene. Like, what are you going to do with Dallas? Bam, bam, bam. Okay, well, what are you going to do with his body? And then just the sound of a chainsaw. <laughs> <laughs> you, you can't just leave all those pieces of dead body lying around, for God's sake. And then just the sound of digging and just see how long this can yeah, like go. <laughs> <laughs> So as there as as that should be happening, what's happening instead um, is that Tom the Smuggler is that's uh, Negan's character um, is getting offered his job as his old job as a cop back by his wife, and he was to be a cop, but not for the Antichrist. Damn it! Yeah, <laughs> he gets to be a cop and go to community sex parties. Yeah, well, but yeah. his res- but yeah. his resp- I wrote in my notes, and I'm in. But yeah. <laughs> his answer was, "I'd rather be shot." Well, yeah, and she's even like, you know, you know, I I know that you liked fucking me, you know, when we were married. If you do this, then we can fuck again. But he doesn't want her vag unless he owns it. Damn it! Right? He's like, hey, yeah, I don't yeah. want to, I don't want to be there because I know that the Mets have been in there at this point, and it's it's all <laughs> so, ruined. 
Roomy. Like chewing already chewed gum is what they tell me in school <laughs> with tax dollars. I like your country, Marsh. Anyway, yeah. So, but but both also she's like basically trying to talk him into being her informant. You know, she's like, we need somebody without a mark that knows the black market or whatever. So that's sort of going to be the plot or at least the plot that they tease you with through most yeah, of this movie. Is it? Is it? Is no. That, is that right? <laughs> no. It's not. Not at all. It's not even related to the plot. We could meet this guy here and then he could just disappear and show back up fucking 60 minutes later and that would be the same movie. Um, so, okay. And now we we cut to the most awesome cars they could afford to rent for a second set uh, where Davey's arriving with his Porsche. But th there's like apparently there's some problems, right? Because the fence is right away. He's like, mm, yeah, it's nice. He's like, nice. It's a fucking Porsche. Yeah, it's a nice, it's a nice Porsche. <laughs> I said it was nice. Yeah. I don't. Did you want me to like come up with original compliments for each car you steal from me? Like, <laughs> let me tell you something, brother. This Porsche is is really nice, but it's also the. I, I don't know, man. I feel like this is a weird emotional tax on our <laughs> business relationship. You steal cars, just give it to me for money <laughs> now. Thank you. What I love is they they have this argument. And then, they, then uh, David White says, look, let's not talk about this. Let's just go get the fee. And then Tiny walks mm -hmm. off to go get the fee. And they just stand there. And it's like, let's go get the fee. They stay where they are. It's like the end of fucking Waiting for Godot. <laughs> like they're just still there waiting for the fee. And then we've got the bad guy kind of being suspicious. And I'm not surprised he's suspicious because they've all just said, we'll go and get the fee. And he's the only one who moves. So he's like, what the fuck are you guys doing? Come and get the fee with me. Yeah, yeah, and then so they go into the, to his office apparently, where he explains that he doesn't have the fee. Yeah, and at this point, what? he could have said this outside on the phone. Call. Yes, right. When they said right. let's go and get the fee, he could have said, "Oh, I've not got the fee." But he waits where he goes in the, the office himself, hangs around waiting for them to eventually meet him. They sit down, they they pause for a little while, and then he tells them there's no fee. I mean, what a dick move by offense. Yeah, well, to no be fair, kidding. We did miss an amazing scene where he was like, great, fellas, go ahead and have a seat. Can I get you anything? Water, coffee, juice. Ooh, do you have coffee? I do. I do. Do you have decaf? Nope. Just just regular. Um, oh, could you make decaf? Nope. Uh, I don't have I don't have that. Also, I don't have your fee. Then that's what we got. <laughs> And action. Yeah, so they're all pissed off and they're like, well, I guess we're leaving and we're taking our Porsche. And he's like, well, yeah, because I didn't I didn't buy it. Well, obviously you would take it. I didn't expect that you would leave it. But also he's joined up with the Antichrist. He's taken his mark now, they realize, and he's sold them out. Uh, and that's when we hear the cops and it's time for a good old fashioned car scene. And we mean old fashioned. And I had a music note here, which was a supermarket own brand version of the Chemical Brothers, like the Science <laughs> Siblings, something like that. The Chemical <laughs> Brothers, you get those guys in the US, yeah, the, the Science Siblings, I thought, because it sounds just like that. The the music in this movie was sarcastic from start to fucking finish. They had a <laughs> yeah. music director that was like, "Oh fuck these guys!" You know, he tried to get him to. He's like, "Well, can you donate your time for Jesus?" It was one of those types of moments. Yeah, yeah. Sarcastic jock jams is my note here. <laughs> <laughs> dun, 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 dun. Are you all ready for this? Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> And I got I have to say this car chase that we're about to go on with this Porsche is about as eventful as OJ's. Yeah, yeah. I mean at the start of it they drive through a field of wheat and I was sat there going it's Theresa May she went that way get her get her get her, get her, get her, get her. <laughs> it's the worst thing she's done it lost her those seats guys it lost yeah, so her it's, those it's, seats. you can't just we were run horrified as how naughty she was. Uh, the naughtiest thing she's ever done, yeah. Not, like, uh, fucking up this entire election, not going for the hardest <laughs> Brexit possible, not when she was uh, the uh, in the home office and draw, had a van drive around London saying, immigrants, go home, which oh, she Jesus. did. No, no, it's the, the wheat thing, mainly, the wheat thing. <laughs> <laughs> the, queen is, the queen's watching that on TV, and she's like, my grandpa told me I'm a god. He <laughs> <laughs> needs to go. I'm going to give a speech tomorrow. <laughs> so anyway, back to our mostly straight, all at the same speed <laughs> car chase. Um, I I love, because you can tell what's going on here is that they could not afford to get that Porsche dirty. 
you know, let yeah. alone dent it. <laughs> so they're just driving along at 35 miles an hour, and they're telling the cops, try to weave a little bit, make it look like we're trying to lose you. Yeah, and then they go straight, and then they just follow the road around to the left, and one of the cop ca- cars doesn't. But they're not even yes. going that fast. And the road no. doesn't, it's not like it's a crossroads and they've taken a quick left. The road just turns naturally left, and one of the cop cars goes straight forward into a field. Like, have they not got steering wheels in those fucking cop cars? <laughs> this happens right. like twice in this. Yeah, just after they go a bit further, and then the road curls around the right, and the same cop car goes <laughs> off straight again. And it's like when you have a, a scale X tricks as a kid, and you just you're going too fast. And it's like just slow down, and it'll go around the corner naturally. Just you don't have to be full speed at all times. You'll learn your fucking lesson here. Uh, and what's so amazing about this is it's so obvious that they can't do anything to this car, including like crash it, because the way the car chase ends is the car stops itself. Yeah, I mean, um, it, it, it ran out of gas, but we knew it ran out of gas because the engine started revving uncontrollably. If you listen yeah, carefully, what? <laughs> well, that's how is that thing. happening? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's like, I'll lose around these hairpin turns. And we're like, are you, are you really going to go around hairpin turns in that thing? And then suddenly the car starts to slow down. They're like, fuck, we're out of gas. Really? That's all you. Yeah. Oh, oh man. Those because... hairpin turns would have been awesome, guys. <laughs> <laughs> no. Oh, Especially with we the cop's drift. ability to steer. I'd have loved to see that cop doing the hairpin turns. Just every <laughs> fucking corner. He's off. So now we get the, the 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 slammer sound along with a shot of the outside of my middle school and <laughs> Davy A.R. White and his now slightly redheaded buddy uh, are in prison <laughs> while someone says, if you refuse to take the mark, your death is certain in exactly the stand clear of the closing doors voice over and over yeah. again. Yeah. I, what I love as well is you, you've got Jerry in the uh, in the prison with him. And Jerry's really pissed off that they ran out of gas because he's like, why didn't we fill the tank? It's like, yeah, Jerry, we've just stolen the car that we're about to deliver to our fence. We're going to stop to fill the tank yeah, to the top right. as we deliver. Fucking what? Uh, Jerry, by the way, is, is the uh, increasingly redheaded buddy there. Yeah, I have yeah, him yeah, ultimately yeah, down yeah. as buddy and howdy doody and all kind of shit in my notes. But Jerry is the the, the character's name. Yeah. Um, so now and now we have to go back to Negan for the torture scene. Yeah, yeah this is, it's an incredible scene. He, it, this is full Flash Gordon mode. He's, <laughs> he, he looks like he's, he's wearing a Flash Gordon outfit. He's strung up yep. by his arms in a sort of a crucifixion esque style. It's amazing. Yeah, and oh. to literal haunted house ambiance. Yes, it's literally like. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I want the theremin and everything. Because the torturer, he's just chewing scenery and he's like, torture. Do you like my spooky green lighting? I requested it. <laughs> Especially, they said, you know, don't you just need normal lights in here? And I was like, actually, green would be really great. And they were like, oh, we'd need to get some kind of gel covers because they don't make LEDs in green. So I, I got the gel. Um, what do you, do you like it? Oh, this actor is amazing. He was so going for it. Um, yeah. So they have this little bald uncle. They, the guy looks like, honestly, like, Eli looks right now, but it, 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 it's the best he's, he's Caliban like, yeah. from the, the latest Logan film. Throughout yeah. the film, I, I start referring to okay. Caliban. All right. No, that makes perfect sense. Um, so, yeah, yeah. And he's describing all the methods. He's, he, he, the whole scene starts off with him going, torture. torture yeah, ancient torture is was so prison, primitive. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Having his little soliloquy about ancient torture. He's also describing methods of execution that aren't necessarily like information extraction methods. He's like, yeah, hanging. Yeah. Electric That's not chair. a torture. Hey, wait a minute. Well, he says that um, often subjects would die before useful information was obtained when you draw and quarter them. It's like, yeah, yes. you fucking draw them. You've split them into four pieces. You want to get the information out of them before you do that, not yes. after. Unless your information is what they had for breakfast, which you could plausibly figure out from that technique. Wait, wait, wait. What are you... Oh, oh, he's all dead. <laughs> Damn it. Shit, shit. I, I always get the order on that wrong. Yeah, right. And this is supposed to be their torture expert guy. Um. So, yeah. But at the same time, they're also torturing Negan with their with their virtual torture device, the button yeah, torture. He's, he's got a remote control for that as well, which I think is lazy because he stood right next to that machine. I think he can just <laughs> use the buttons on the machine. It seems weird to have a, a remote control that close to the machine. 
Well, that way you can monologue. You don't want to be like, let me tell you, sir, you will always regret. Sorry, one second. <laughs> you will always regret. You're just, God, I set this to four. <laughs> Alan, were you messing around with the torture machine? Okay, well, no, no, because I said it the way I like it. And then you come in here. Well, it's my time. No, it is my time. Check the sheet on the outside of the door. Alan. So... <laughs> <laughs> so they torture him, uh, and and it's, it gets so bad he blurs a bit at a <laughs> yep. certain yeah, point. Yeah, they love the blurry shot in there, the, the dramatic oh, blurry shot. Oh, don't they? And also, I want to point this out, because the, the bad guy is saying, like, you know, we have this virtual torture device, uh, blah, blah, blah. It's so much less messy than actually ripping someone's guts out. And I feel like, I'm, I'm like, I feel like pain or no, the fact that I know my guts aren't actually rip, being ripped out makes this easier to handle. Well, and not let's not forget our favorite torture. She goes, he goes, he's had the feeling of broken glass shoved in every orifice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I when I saw that, I, I heard that, I thought, what do they mean by every? I mean, are we talking the main two or are we going up to all seven? Right. Yeah, like, I, hold I, on. I, think I haven't, need to this. haven't done the left nostril yet. Hold <laughs> on. We're not done. He might break after the left nostril. <laughs> right. And then he goes, I guess it's time to get creative and it's like really glass up your butt isn't creative <laughs> well yeah i thought they had been pretty creative i wanted to see what the options around like creative torture that they threw out were like making him walk barefoot or in the dark over some lego or uh, <laughs> making him have the sensation of sitting down in a public toilet in the dark and your cock accidentally touches the inside of the porcelain rim <laughs> like, that, that that torture <laughs> yeah, it's just uh, standing in line behind someone who's paying in pennies. No, go back to the glass up my butt thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I had like just a Christmas sitting... dinner where you've got to explain to your grandma why it's not okay for her to use the N-word. Uh, and <laughs> no, no, no colored isn't any better, grandma. No, no, it, it kind of is up to them to say what's okay. <laughs> just, just <that. laughs> Can I get more glass? I just really, I would like more glass. <laughs> no, I know that you're old. That I don't really know why you keep bringing that up. Is that <laughs> you want me to? Res I know you want me to respect that, but it's literally just a matter. There are older people than you. Do you look up to them? Where does it end? <laughs> does death matter? <laughs> now, the important thing though is that torture ghoul character is super impressed with Negan's taking it skills. Apparently. Uh, he hates torturing Christians because they don't scream enough or whatever. Yeah, because they just forgive you. Yeah, yeah. Christians are annoying, says this movie. It's like, over yeah, and over again. Board. We are so on board right now. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Um, so, okay, now we, we head to the the prisoner's beheading yard uh, where everyone is dressed like Ghostbusters boot camp. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and what we learn is... Every morning, everyone gets lined up whose, like, time has expired, and they all get, like, a line of guillotine guillotines. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I feel like it wouldn't be that much tougher to, like, set the guillotine so they all, like, swished at a slightly different note. You know, we could have a <laughs> da, 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 shing, 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 shing. You know, something oh. like that. They didn't bother, I feel like, you know. Get it sponsored. Get a little jingle yeah. going there. Yeah, right, right. NBC could be into that. You never yeah. know. <laughs> well, I mean, th this is going to mean nothing to you guys, but there's a bald guy getting strapped into the guillotine, and he looks exactly like Ross Kemp, who is an actor uh, in the UK who was on uh, EastEnders, which is like a long-running soap. And what, what I liked about it was he was a TV tough guy. His character was like a big kind of tough guy. And then after he left that soap, he started making documentaries about prison gangs. And it was called Ross Kemp on Gangs. So it makes this scene just feel like an extreme episode of Ross Kemp on Gangs. So fuck, <laughs> he's, I mean, he's, he's got the wrong prison there. That's what Ross Kemp's done. <laughs> <laughs> so meanwhile, the torture is still torturey. Yeah. And the, yep. the torture he's having now is he's having his skin peeled off his body. Now, previously, he was having his skin burnt off his body. So their idea of getting more creative is a different way of taking the skin off the body. <laughs> uh, but at a certain point, of course, uh, the emergency no human being could take that much torture alarm goes off. Uh, so they have to stop. I love the uh, the graphic on this alarm <laughs> as well. Yeah. It's, it's just a floating head. Yeah, it's a spinning blue head, and yeah. I have no idea what purpose that head serves. I think it's the how many heads does he have monitor. And it's, saying, yeah, it's, it's still one. It's still one. It's not shit. We're good on the head front. It's still one. And the head the head looks like Zordon from the Power Rangers as well. So it's just a spinning yes. Zordon as he's being tortured. 
I was thinking Blue Man Group, but yeah, right around there. Yeah, exactly. And there's no information displayed on the head, by the way. It's just a spinning head, in case you were wondering what his head looks like in three dimensions. <laughs> well, to be fair, Blue Man Group is a great level of torture. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, what level of torture are we at? Seeing Blue Man Group. Oh, wow, that's really bad. Yeah, we should stop. He's going to die. <laughs> <laughs> that could be it. Um, and now the ex-wife shows up because, like, I guess he's all the way broken. Yeah, he said he'll. He said I'll do anything to make this torture stop. Yeah. Uh, at which point, I think the torture missed an opportunity to, to re revisit that whole orifices conversation. I felt like <laughs> that was his chance, and he let that slip. You know, it's not broken huh? glass. <laughs> hey, you know what? The great thing about anything is that anything can have an and. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. So she comes in and and tells him, you know, she's like, here's some water. Now, what the reason we tortured you is that we want you to find and kill Elijah Cohen. Hint, he's Jewish. <laughs> <laughs> so now we head back to uh, to Davy late at night in the prison. Um, and his buddy is on the bunk ahead of him. Not really sure about this whole getting beheaded thing. Doesn't know how he feels about it. I just want to throw out there that he is posed. David R. White is posed like, draw me one of your French girls. Yes. yes. I, I, the, the my, my note was, preach to me like one of your French girls. That's what I had in my notes. <laughs> <laughs> my note, I watched it last, so my note was, damn it, both of these guys, guys beat me to the Kate Winslet joke. Um, <laughs> now, and we also, we see from, okay, so there, I, we should point out that there are biblical passages scrawled all through the walls of this prison in giant letters, right? Everywhere you go, there's Bible written on the walls. And we're watching David A.R. White read these, but we see him from behind laying like the draw me one of your French girls, like one of your French girls uh, pose. So it really seems like he's beating off to this part of the scripture. <laughs> it's hard not to interpret it as that. Also, do they give out markers or colored chalk <laughs> at the prison? Because it's, it's all different colors and aesthetics. It's, it's really well done. Yeah, yeah. I, I was wondering what percentage of it was written in excrement. That's the only thing that was going through my mind. It's got to be about thirty percent at this point. Oh, one of them, one of the prisoners, is going to have seen that everyone's writing, have written all those Bible verses in his own excrement, and then someone comes in with the markers. Like, man, what what are you doing? You wait, you wait for the marker first. Well, well now I feel silly. <laughs> yeah, Moon, you gotta wash the walls. No, I just finished John three sixteen. It's like. How about we do markers over it? No, I'm not drawing in your shit. Well, it's uh, okay. Fine, <laughs> fine. I love to. So, so there. This and I feel like the only reason they did this was so that this movie would have no end of reasons to just read the Bible, right? So there's a number yeah. of times in this movie we have to watch people read Bible passages, and since it's on the wall, anyone can at any point just turn to the wall and go, "Hmm, this appropriate Bible passage is written right next to me." Uh, the first time we see it, it's something out of Romans. Yeah, and he says, uh, it says, it says Romans is what the character says. And I was really hoping he was going to say, it says Romans go home. <laughs> yeah, it was uh, Romanus A and Doma. And then it says uh, Romani Ite Domum a bunch of times. It's, it's weird. I don't really understand. <laughs> Guy in a toga jumps off the top bunk. I know where I'm not wanted. <laughs> Yeah, and okay, so the, the two of these guys are bitching, Davey and Jerry. They're talking about like, yeah, well, we'll never escape or whatever. And and I'm like, hmm, it's a good thing you have a master break your in and outer guy with you. And I think, I'm <laughs> thinking to myself at this point, wow, this is really poorly set up that they have the master break in out guy in the prison or whatever with him. But they never use that. <laughs> no, no, it never, it never comes up. The, the two people we saw breaking and entering using their amazing technical skills and their burgling skills don't use either of those skills to get out of prison. It's incredible. No, no. Instead, they just read more epistles, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> to which, to which David A.R. White walks away with this. His message from the epistles is, look, all I know is if this God feller murdered his own kid, he's one tough Mother flunker. <laughs> <laughs> oh God. And I should I should point out here, the music director said at some point, there is no superlative form of cheesy. <laughs> and that was all he needed. 
the music in this scene is so loud that it starts to drown out the dialogue, and I can only assume that's because they heard the dialogue. <laughs> like, just, just turn it up. No, keep, keep turning it up. Keep turning it up. It's fine. It's fine. Yeah, swell it. Swell it more. Swell it more. Um, and, okay, so now Negan and his ex-wife go to meet the evil boss in the weird fucking 1970s foyer. Yeah, turtlenecks will be in... <laughs> and basically, he comes in, and the bad guy is like, I will now read your exposition. To which Negan <laughs> goes, why did you read my exposition? And he goes, ha, 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 you joke. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, we need your help taking out deviants. And he's like, well, what do you call deviants? And... That the implied question is like, oh, you call them deviant, but you guys do butt stuff and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so, and he's, and then he's like, oh, and we should tell you the person we want you to kill, Mr. Cohen, he's super dangerous. I mean, Cohen, guys. <laughs> Cohen. Well, we learn he's dangerous because he's such a good recruiter of Christians. <laughs> yes. And they yeah, show yeah, us, he's like, dangerous. I brought a clip. I brought a clip. <laughs> Yeah, he he is the least charismatic preacher I think I've ever seen. It's so fucking boring in watch, uh, watching him preach. It's, it's like listening to someone describe a land parcel at an auction <laughs> in the northwest corner or the southeast corner of the northwest corner of the lot on the fourth side. Yeah, oh my God, he was boring. Yeah, so but basically we just see a video of some dude that looks like Max Cherry fucked Jeff Ross standing there going like, uh, you guys, uh, you know, if you don't listen to me, are going to go to hell, so... Yeah, and, and as unimpressed as we are by this, they react to it like they've just been watching, like looking at all of the schematics for the Death Star. They're like, oh, <laughs> like they're just totally <laughs> taken aback by this guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, but, but apparently in order to, to kill him, they need somebody that doesn't have an implant, because that's the only way to get close to him. Right. I didn't, I don't understand this at all. I don't understand. It's like, nobody can get close to him, so we'll send you to prison to hang around with some people we know can get close to him. Yeah. It just, uh, I don't understand this for this plan at all. Wait, why don't you just watch them go plays? Yeah, right. Okay. So, yeah, the plot here, and, and again, this is not the fucking plot. This is one of the whack-a-mole <laughs> plots. Um, but the plot is that they're going to put him in prison, but fakely so he can escape with some bad guys that can then take him to Elijah Co. It's the oldest goddamn bullshit. Anyway, so we cut to the prison. And hacker dude, Jerry, whose hair is growing ever so much slightly redder in every scene. It definitely is. This is when I first really, really noticed it. And uh, it gets worse. It's incredible. It's real. I, I feel like someone in hair and makeup was fucking with us. They were just like, <laughs> just a little redder in every scene. Just a little bit redder. One shade redder. Because you know the hair and makeup guy is gay, and he hears that deviant line in the last scene. He's like, oh, <laughs> deviant, am I? All right. Nope, it's the same as last week. You're oh, doing my such God. A good job. Dude, you have just explained David A.R. White's hairdo to me <laughs> i've been wondering about that for four fucking years now and that and now it all makes sense that his hairstylist has seen his movies ah oh, no it looks great on you no frosted it's still in i swear right yeah <laughs> oh my god and also by the way okay so we see the two the jesus freak jerry and 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 davy we see him hanging out at the prison and everything going like, I don't know who's worse, these uh, morons who have the implant or these Jesus freaks. And I'm like, if you're not Christian, why wouldn't you just be taking the implant? They make so little effort. Like, he's the kind of guy who seems like he would like to fuck a lot of people and live for 200 years to me. Yeah, especially since David R. White will establish as his character later on. He's like, I sure would like to fuck something. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. But, but not Mark. Fuck. I want to do it the old-fashioned way. I, I guess. I guess like having sex once you have the mark is like having sex with condoms. It feels weird, and no one should do it. <laughs> <laughs> condoms are gross. Don't wear condoms. <laughs> if there's one thing you take away from this show, <laughs> yeah, it's public health broadcasting. I like it. <laughs> So, okay, so now Negan gets put in his cell, and he sees all the Bible scrawling, so he reads it out loud to us. Yeah, and these walls look indistinguishable from the pages from the notebooks in Seven. Yes. It, it could not be a closer thing. Right, and, and he's reading it to himself, and then all of a sudden we see in shadow his cellmate, <laughs> Stephen Baldwin. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. 
I'm pretty sure he's also in the French girl pause, which I assume is now mandatory in this prison. <laughs> but everyone, if you're going to lie in bed, it has to be in the pit me like a French girl pause. And he emerges into the light like a beautiful swan wearing <laughs> the most ridiculous pair of glasses you've ever yes. seen. Be yeah, spectacles, Stephen Baldwin. <laughs> Stephen Baldwin. They're, they're glasses he stole from a doll. They are doll glasses that he's wearing. <laughs> Stephen Baldwin is what would happen if the Scarlet Witch had said stupid instead of no more mutants. So they were like, well, he's supposed to be the smart guy in this movie, so let's put glasses on him. But instead, he just looks like a racist character from the 1930s. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Looks like Andy Rooney doing his best. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so he comes, he pops out like he's reading the Bible um, and Stephen Baldwin pops out and he says, oh, are you a Christian as well? And, you know, of course, he he's, has to pretend like he is so he can get to Elijah Cohen. He's like, yeah, I totally Jesus all the time. Amen. Um, and he's like, oh, yeah, well, then what does this parable about the virgins and the oil mean? You know, like prove your Christianity to Stevie boy, which, by the way, I could go to like 306 Christians in, in, in a row and ask them to give me the meaning of this parable. And I would probably not get one that actually had even read it or was familiar with it. Right. I wanted him so badly to be like, I think it means RSVP for a wedding. You dicks. Come on. Can't just show up. It's plated. Yeah. <laughs> but he decodes it wrong. He doesn't get it. Um, apparently Jesus would videotape the fight with his phone. <laughs> yeah, Marsh, you don't get that. You don't get to get that one. Sorry. <laughs> um, but, uh, but so he's like, mm, no, I don't think you're Christian enough for me. And this is also apparently where we learned that, uh, Stephen Baldwin has magic powers, magic powers. Uh, and we learned this when he suddenly knows Tom's name out of nowhere. Yeah. Uh, he knows his name and he also knows that he's a fool. Because yeah, because God narked Negan out. <laughs> Apparently, yeah, and also he, I, I love too that he's like, you know what? I'll tell you what that Bible passage means. The bridegroom is, you know what? Fuck, it means that you need salvation. Is what it needs. <laughs> That's really the, yeah. he like gives up. He gives up eight words in. Yeah, and he he, he does say that once you do get saved, everyone becomes more like Jesus, and he says more unique and more individual. Just like Jesus. So yeah, we yeah, come, we come as individuals oh. and unique in exactly the same fashion. As Jesus. <laughs> Your uniqueness increases a little bit at a time, does it? Just That's like interesting. Jesus, who is the what? most unique? <laughs> yeah. in his Jesusness? I'm uniquer than Jesus, I think. Uh, anyway, yeah. Okay, so now we cut to the cafeteria where everybody's going to meet up, where uh, uh, Tom or Negan and... Um, uh, Stephen Baldwin are going to meet up with uh, David A.R. White and Howdy Doody. Yeah, we see everybody we've seen so far, and then a guy called Joe that we've not met before. And I don't know who he is, but I took an instant dislike to this Joe character. He just <laughs> seems the most annoying, sniffing little prick I've ever seen on film. Right, and then he, he says, uh, Tom here is going to bust you out. Yeah, but Stephen Baldwin does, because apparently God speaks to Stephen Baldwin and tells him plot points that they couldn't think of a way to get out in natural conversation. So he says, yeah, this Tom here, this guy is going to break you two out. And he's like, "How? I'm not going to ruin the surprise. Yeah, then they kind of go around the table to say, like, who else is busting out? They ask Joe if he's busting out. He silently drinks his water. Non-committal bullshit. Fuck you, Joe. I don't like that. <laughs> Just put your chip down, asshole. <laughs> yeah, and this is where they clarify that everyone else in the prison is a crazy person who doesn't mind dying because they're going to be kings who live and reign with Christ for a thousand years. Yes. Uh -huh. yeah, at which point, David A.R. White mocks them all for believing that and again, accidentally speaks for all of us in doing that. <laughs> yeah, right. But luckily for the Christians, they can prove their book is true by quoting the parts of it where it says it's true. So David A.R. White doesn't stand a chance. <laughs> I love to. Okay, so then we see who the hell knows when this happened in relation to the last scene. But we see Tom chasing down uh, a blonde bad guy lady prison guard who is 
Andrea uh, Logan White. David A.R. White's wife. He sneaks it's her into all of them. Was. Yes. Uh, nice. And the only purpose of this scene, because she says, he's like, hey, can you bring my wife a message? She's like, nope. And then that's the end of the scene. <laughs> well, just wanted okay, a line. Right. Well, she said more words than that. <laughs> she, oh, that's right. He can only talk to his wife if he gets the implant. Yeah, that gets her over the pay bump there. So, yeah. <laughs> and now it's, and that's the only message. Because okay. again, he's the next time we see him, eventually he's going to be with the wife. So it doesn't matter at all. So now it's time for prison Bible study with Stephen. Oh, you don't even get out of Bible study in prison. That's the <laughs> worst part. Oh yeah, my especially God. when David A. White is, the, is an atheist and yet he still went why did he go why? to this why did he not just leave why did he turn up to this bible class I'm just saying if you murdered or raped Stephen Baldwin I bet you could get out of bible study I'm just saying I'm just <laughs> throwing out ideas for when we're all there I mean I'm taking the mark because I want to live 200 years and have group sex yes. <laughs> so yeah and I, I love okay, this is a very very long scene where they basically like give us a whole bunch of Christian apologetics and how do you know there's a God? Well, because you just know and trees and plants and stars. I'm like, the Muslims called that one. Sorry. Sorry, <laughs> well, guys. I, I want to throw up my favorite moment in this scene because it, it really is super dumb. But the, my favorite moment in this scene is one we haven't had before is he's doing the trees are the at proof of God. And David R. White goes, well, that's called the cosmological argument. And it was defeated by Pascal. To which Stephen Baldwin replies, "Yeah, but Pascal was a Christian." Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this but is they, this is to <laughs> philosophy as Star Trek is to physics. This conversation, <laughs> it was fucking painful. But damn it, can Stephen Baldwin jingle his keys with gravitas? Oh yeah. <laughs> and, to, to, and again, the they end on look. All right, fine, fine. Uh, even though I just totally got you with that Pascal thing. There is no evidence, but it's written in your heart. Yes, the argument from the God-sized atrial septal defect again. <laughs> so yeah, I don't need to convince sake. you because deep inside you already agree with me, which I'm going to try the next time I'm arguing with my wife, Nicola. I, yeah. I, I'll see how well that works. Because like, I can't convince you. I know you won't be able to convince anyone to believe in anything. That's what he also says in it. You can't convince yeah. anyone to believe in anything. Bring There's something you never have to say when you're not full of shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah oh my god the, the whole thing the argument from deep down you agree with me because christians wrote your lines and i love too that like david air white is ready to go to fisticuffs over this too oh yeah <laughs> especially after you talk shit about blaze i guess <laughs> so, so then we okay so we so we see tom leaving bible study um, and David A.R. White jumps up and like choke holds him and demands his backstory. <laughs> That's the best. Okay. <laughs> David R. White <laughs> trying to choke out this actor yes! is, at, while they pretend to struggle is like if we shot a scene where Madge tried to choke out Heath. <laughs> <laughs> Drop me on the floor, guy. damn it. It's like the scene in uh, Princess Bride where he has to fight Andre the Giant or something. <laughs> He's just hanging off the back of him. Oh, my God. Yeah. Uh, but Tom does out wrestle him eventually. I wanted David R. White to stand up and have very clearly shat himself <laughs> in his jumpsuit, but no one acknowledges it. <laughs> All right, so now we head back to the uh, to the cafeteria where all the Ghostbusters in training are clapping about something. We will never know what. The scene begins with Stephen Baldwin going, that was very nice. <laughs> <laughs> so he introduces Lewis, uh, who would like to say a few words. Uh, now, Lewis is sad that he's going to have to miss prayers tomorrow so that he can go get his head chopped off to be with Jesus. Yeah, so, so Lewis dies tomorrow. This is one of the things that, uh, that confuses me. Stephen Baldwin's going to die in four days. Uh, the, the, the two guys, uh, Jerry and uh, David L. White, are going to die in 19 days. Lewis dies tomorrow. The scheduling, is, is it daily executions? Because I was trying to work out, there are like 16 people in this prison. All, they all seem to be around that table. They're killing people at a rate of four or five a time. And they still got to get to 19 days worth. They're going to run out of prison. They, they really need to schedule all this miles better. Well, I guess what we're supposed to believe, right, is that once you go into the prison, you have 30 days to either take the mark or get your head chopped off. 
or, or 20 or five day, whatever it is. But what I love is that it's always exactly five people that they bring out to execute. It's like there's always yeah. five people that 30 days ago went into prison and decided today, no, nope, I'm not going to take the mark. Which makes me wonder, do they have to hold some prisoners back because they filled the quarter for that day? Oh. Otherwise, they'll have like six or seven to kill at once. They have enough <laughs> guillotines for that. Or do they do like an afternoon session on the guillotines? Well, that, we, we may just not see that one. Yeah, that could be. Yeah, uh, yeah. Some guy just waiting to decide. It's it's weird that like he got his own guillotine, but I have to share one. I just... <laughs> <laughs> All right, so all right, now we get as Lewis is going on about his long boring thing, we get his flashback to this is the most useless scene in this movie and every scene has a legitimate claim to that title, but this is mm -hmm. the most useless moment in this movie and it's just there because this black dude is such a better actor than everyone else in this movie. Yeah, he's they're great. like, oh, he oh really fuck, we need great. to actually let him act a little bit. But what they get him to do is to show his backstory, which is him, like, pissing off some refugees in a car. And his car's quite... It, it looks like, in his previous life, he drove around Kit from Knight Rider and at one point tried to pick up an 11-year-old girl. <laughs> yeah. No wonder you're in fucking prison, man. Yeah. And then they very, very obviously pull him out of his car and kick the shit out of him. Yeah. Which he somehow didn't expect in this Yeah, scene. right? Just, what the hell? rolling through these people and he's like, oh, you're poor and I'm not. Oh, I want to fuck a child. Oh, <laughs> what's going on? And then they're like, oh, we're going to fight you. And he's like, holy shit, they can see me? <laughs> Eli, cautionary tale. Cautionary tale, Eli. This is what happens when you go around saying you want to fuck a child. Take this to heart. <laughs> This is why we're not allowed to be in parades. <laughs> this is the ghost of, uh, of Christmas future for you, Eli. Just be aware of these things. So after the ass kicking, he's sitting there. They've apparently stolen his cars. Everything but his wheels. There's Except some wheels for the left. It looks like he left his wheels. I don't think those were supposed to be the wheels from his car. Like he just found some wheels. But that's certainly what it looks like is that they stole everything except for two of the wheels and the axle that connects them. Um, and after the ass kicking, a Christian finds him. This is <laughs> Elijah Cohen. He's yeah, and at so this point, bad. Elijah Cohen to me looks like a cross between a pedophile and a magician from the 90s, which I realize <laughs> is a tautology. <laughs> <laughs> And there's this amazing scene. It's just a little moment. But Elijah Cohen is like, here, have some water. And he tries to, like, feed the other actor water. And the actor is very much like, oh, no, thank you. I'll actually just take the thing. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but basically he's saying, and that's how I became a Christian. Bunch of white men beat me up for having a nicer car than them. That's what all Christians should do to bring the black folks to the Lord. This movie. <laughs> yeah, it, it's basically saying sometimes all it takes is for the people that you're randomly insulting to beat you up and steal your car and then damage your face so much you look like you've got mumps. And that's all it takes for you to realize that your life isn't quite going as you wanted it to. You that, that, that's the life give lesson me learning. mumps. <laughs> right. And, he talks about how, oh, you know, I, I confessed some terrible sins. Yeah, yeah. He said what poured out to me was vile, and I want to know what he's done, and I'm pretty sure it's those 11-year-old girls. I'm <laughs> sure that's what he, could, what he admitted to. Well, when he said what poured out of me was vile, I just wrote money shot. But it looks really, really bad now <laughs> because Marsh wrote his 11-year-old girl joke right above that one. So <laughs> I think I need to erase that for posterity's sake. Um, but yeah, and I wanted to say this this meeting between Lewis and Elijah Cohen gets super, super touchy. It is Very touchy. not at all heterosexual. I'm not judging it except in its level of heterosexuality, which is low. <laughs> yeah. Did they like lean against the car and the car had two marks on it? And it was like, hey, why don't we? Oh, damn it. I got a mark <laughs> on my shoulder. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. And then he's he's doing like a shout something he's like oh lord it's a something tambourine something something <laughs> yes and when he looked up from his shout praying the magic jew had disappeared yeah and and david r white's like you mean he ran away and he's like no man like, I'm like in the Batman. middle of my thing. <laughs> Stop like interrupting. Batman. <laughs> what, what, what he said was, he says, uh, and, and like, poof, he was gone. And I told you he was a 90s magician. This is why he was <laughs> I've seen this. The masked magician gave that trick away. It involves, I think it's like a trap door and three panes of glass and some fine thread. And I think Elijah Cohen was actually triplets all along. That's how it works. The masked magician, I swear. <laughs> and now, okay, so that's over. We're done with that character. 
Um, so now it's time for Stevie's good night prayers, which Tom thinks you're stupid. <laughs> Why would you do that? And I wanted him to be like, what? And be like, pray like you're having a staring contest with God. <laughs> but the bigger question is why he stands silently behind him while he's praying. He's just yeah. stood there behind him. <laughs> like, that should have been the question. Like, why are you stood there? This is now weird. <laughs> it was normal when it was just me. But yeah, now it is kind of weird. <laughs> um, so, okay. So, yeah. And and Tom says to him, hey, do you know Elijah Cohen by any chance? And Stephen Bowman's like, uh, yeah, no, God told me you were trying to kill him. No, what? <laughs> yeah, literally, it's the worst job at being a liar ever. He's like, are you going to kill Elijah Cohen? Two, three. No. What? <laughs> no. And of course, Baldwin gets pissed. He's like, are you calling God a liar? Um, I don't think that I'm I'm talking to him. Okay. <laughs> At this point, I noticed that uh, the guy who plays Negan is now starting to look a bit like a swollen Robert Downey Jr. Yep. Okay. All right. Yeah, like the pressure wasn't quite right in the Iron Man suit. He just... <laughs> yeah. All right. And, and this scene ends with this very, very weird moment where Stephen Baldwin, who's trying to convince Negan to be <laughs> Christian, is like, oh, uh, I know you miss your wife. What if I told you your wife right now is getting fucked? She's getting fucked real hard, man. <laughs> real, real hard. And he's like, well, I would I'd kick the shit out of you. And he's like, oh, okay. Should, shouldn't have said that then. <laughs> but yeah. what he says is, uh, he, instead he says, did your God tell you that? And I really wanted Stephen Baldwin to say, no, I mean, I can see her. She, she's literally just there in the prison corridor. Like, <laughs> in the prisons. Real? Three at a time. Honestly, if you come around from this angle, you can see everything. <laughs> like, so t t uh, Tom beats him up for all the wife fucking talk. Oh, B movie, but every time they say B, it's someone beating up Stephen Baldwin. That's what I want. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that's and of course the whole time Baldwin's being a Christian hero, so he's going, "I forgive you for punching me in the face. I forgive you for punching me in the face. I forgive you for punching." You know, the whole fucking time. Anyway, and oh, and as this is going on, we have to cut over to Jerry and uh, Davy in the other cell because Jerry's all worried about Stephen. Yeah, and he is significantly more ginger again. Significantly oh, yeah. more ginger. He just gets redder by the second. <laughs> but Davey, of course, is too callous and Han Solo like to care about stupid Steve and get beat up. And th th there's a great line from Jerry where he says, uh, This is not like any prison I've ever heard of. And it's like, Yeah, of course it isn't. There's 16 inmates and like, hardly any of them are black. So this is not <laughs> like any prison. <laughs> I'm saying the American justice system is, is unfairly biased, biased against African-Americans. That's what I'm saying. That's all I'm saying there. Yeah, that's, no, that's what I meant by that. Non-racists have to all the time explain that they're not racist. All the time, Marsh. I get it. Really fill in those Shaheed shoes. I really appreciate that company. Right in. And then we have to cut to Tom and his wife discussing the plan, his ex-wife discussing the plan, right, to yeah. break him out of prison. To remind you that this movie had a plot that you, or <laughs> at least you thought it did. Um, but he can't, he can't seem to get any of the Christians talked into selling out Cohen because they don't care about getting guillotined to death. That just means they get to get to Jesus faster. And he's like, you're not punishing them. They love getting their heads cut off. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then he says to her, haven't you read any of what they believe? And I wanted her to say, well, no, but to be fair, neither of most of them are. <laughs> <laughs> no, they haven't read it either. <laughs> I, I love to because like Tom's like yeah I can't convince any of them to do it and she's like well you can't break out of the prison until you do he's like no I quit the prison yeah yeah what and she says you've got two and a half weeks until your execution I suggest you become more persuasive and I wrote why I mean Christianity has had 2,000 years and this is as persuasive as it gets <laughs> <Because essentially, laughs> don't fuck people and instead you get to hang out with S Stephen Baldwin in a six by eight foot cell covered in religious graffiti and That's then get your head chopped off yeah. yeah exactly <laughs> yeah but she's not gonna let him leave without a follow of a uh, follower of elijah cohen damn it or, or, or they're gonna torture him and since the movie literally just had to have the bad guy tell the hero to get the goddamn plot going or else, I guess it's safe to assume that Act 2 is over and we've earned ourselves a break. But first, let me give Act 3 the hard sell here. Will anything that happens so far relate to anything that happens later? If dying is a good thing, what the fuck are the stakes of this movie? How can nothing happening take so long? Find out the answers to these questions and more when we return for the bizarre series of conclusions of Six The Mark Unleashed.
Thanks to your new implant, you will be allowed to have sex with anyone, male or female. Yep, way ahead of you. I'm sorry? Yeah, sorry, I just, I didn't need an implant for that. But your natural tendency... Yeah, not, not me so much, just kind of... Right. Well, well, just in case we've had you, I'm, I'm a video screen. I'm a recorded hologram. So So, no, right. No, got it. Unclear. Just a note. (laughs) And we're back for more of this shit. When we last left our heroes, they were precisely where they were halfway through act one, despite half of the fucking movie haven't happened since then. So we rejoin Howdy Doody in his cell, contemplating his faith when Team Jesus shows up. Yeah, and we've got Jerry coming in. Jerry is looking redder than ever. Uh, oh fun my. fact, around the time of filming this, the actor was actually auditioning for a gender-blind production of Annie. That's what oh. was going on with his hair. <laughs> and of course, Joe's here. Yeah, I fucking hate Joe. Fucking hate Joe. He's so annoying. <laughs> I was hoping he he would die in this film. I had my money on him being like a red shirt who would die at some point in the escape. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But again, it's one of those, like, it was very obvious that's what they were setting up and then they just yeah. didn't do it moments. Yeah. My only consolation is because there's a point, and this is kind of spoiling it slightly, where we don't see him again. I know deep down he got executed. That's the only <laughs> thing that keeps That's the me real going. comfort. Yeah. yeah. And I love, okay, so they're they're trying to talk Jerry into, you know, joining them in Jesus or whatever. And he's just not so sure about it. Um, he's like, but we have a secret that makes all the fear go away. And he's like, what's the secret? And I'm like, you don't know what that word means, do you? <laughs> yeah, he goes, it's like when you're a kid and you've got a secret. Is that an expression? It's like when you're a kid and you've got a secret? Nope. Uh, no. Nope. No. I think no. that's just you, Steve. And I, I think it's molestation, man. You got, well, you don't have to keep that <laughs> secret anymore, Stephen Baldwin. You can... <laughs> you can tell us that's a weird lie it's like when you're a kid and you promise not to tell about Father Murphy oh, <laughs> never mind you're a Christian now <laughs> and he does he's all Jesus now yeah, yeah. He, he, fall, he kneels and then he falls sideways into Baldwin's arms and if you listen carefully as he falls they play inexplicably the sound effect of an email sending on Mac OS X <laughs> it's just sort of like I don't know why they play that when he falls over. And and now he's so excited that he has to go run and tell Davey all about how amped up he is for Jesus. <laughs> so Jerry's like, I'm all Jesus now. He's like, damn it. And then he walks off. Tom shows up and he's like, I guess a conversation with me is now logical in the progression of this story. What was all that about? <laughs> And he's like, oh, he's all Christian. And because subtlety, thy name is not this movie, <laughs> Stephen Baldwin basically rises from out of shot. He might as well just stand up having been under the frame and goes, oh, a Christian who wants to escape has strings. Funny how the Lord provides. <laughs> See, it's supposed to be that his character is getting messages from God, but I feel like they were like just writing around the fact that Stephen Baldwin just kept sarcastically dissecting the stilted screenwriting. You know, like that, that's what happens. He's just wandering under the scene and he's just like, oh, now all of a sudden there's a Christian that wants to escape. How unexpected. And he walks off and they're like, we're going to have to make that part of his character. Like he, like he's read the plot, but from God or something. So, yeah, so, but they're going to escape now because now he has a Christian in the form of Jerry, so it counts and he's allowed to escape. Right. And we find out that Tom's got a little door unlocker, like a blip blip thing for your car. He's got one of those. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which he's going to use to escape now. Um, and I, it, it something occurred to me, okay, because this movie is so goddamn slow. We've been in this movie for well over an hour. This movie is, like, supposed to open, basically, with a prison break, and we're still in the fucking prison. And I realized, oh, my God, they spent all their money on that Porsche, and they had to film the rest of this movie in Stephen Baldwin's basement, which is why the graffiti is biblical. <laughs> <laughs> it all makes sense now. Right. And Tom's like, well, I'm going to escape. And, and Stephen Baldwin's final words are, you need to look inside yourself. And I just wrote, a hand mirror helps with that kind of stuff, Tom, if you need. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and I had uh, that. It's much easier for him to do that since of all that broken glass that was pres- uh, pressed into his orifices earlier. That's made it way, way easier to look inside yourself. See? Compliment sandwich. <laughs> 
And now, finally, at length, it's time for the goddamn breakout. Now, I should point out, we've spent over an hour of this movie setting up this breakout. The plan here was, run away! <laughs> yeah, yeah, he gets a magic clicker, which opens each of the cell doors. Like, this clicker opens everything. It's like the, the swipey thing we saw earlier, which uh, unlocked everything. Mm-hmm. This clicker... I don't know if it only opens the doors that you're near or the doors you're pointing at or whether one click opens every door in the entire prison. Because as they escape, they only need to click it at the two cell doors and the last door out. Every other door in this prison is just unlocked. So why bother? Why bother? They're, in, they're locked in cells. It's fine. We don't need to lock any of the other doors. We work on a trust It worked really here. well with the Porsche. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Also, as they leave, it's very important. Stephen uh, Baldwin says to Jerry, he's like, whatever you do, pick up the hitchhiker. Yeah, yeah. That's, and Jerry reacts to that as if Stephen Baldwin just asked him to grab a carton of milk while he's at the store. He's, he's just <laughs> totally not like, you're right, check, hit, hitchhiker, got it, anything else while I'm out. It's so relaxed about it, it's ridiculous. And we need to point this out, that this means that, because they've just got the clicker thing, this means that the fact that David R. White and Jerry are also being broken out means nothing, right? We thought it was because of their hacker driver skills, no, but you know. he's just got a clicker, so fuck yourself. They were in the movie, why not take them? Yeah. Well, and again, it would have made so much sense that they he'd, he'd need the getaway driver and the hacker guy, so like it seemed like we had set this up for a reason, but no, it's just that those two happened to be the guys that were next to him when he broke out. And I just want to point out one other thing about this escape, because it makes me so mad. Negan jumps out, chokeholds a guard, right? Mm-hmm. He's, he, he grabs a guard, he chokeholds him, and he drags him off screen. Now, in any good movie, when you drag someone off screen, you reemerge in their clothes. Yes, exactly, in their clothes. Nope, just comes out in his jumpsuit. I was so yes. mad. <laughs> Almost as bad as the decision to go split screen at this point. Oh, God, this wound me up no end. It, 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 it actually makes the, the, the escape less easy to understand where they're going. It's like everything starts yeah. on split screen. And it's like watching an episode of 24, except each plot point takes the entire 24 hours to happen. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, and these split screens are so stupid. Like, one half is showing them coming towards and the other is away. You can practically see the cameras from the other shot. In the split screen. <laughs> so, yeah, so they, again, their plan was, you know, click the thing, go through the thing, find a car and break into it and go away, which is <laughs> how this proceeds. They walk out to the parking lot, too, and there's like five cars there and they take the, the slowest looking one. Yeah, and yeah break- it's like a family station wagon right yeah. next to a jet black car that looks a pretty <laughs> decent kind of saloon kind of car and jet black so you could easily hide at night. But no, yeah. take the bright white, totally fucking <laughs> square family station wagon. That's the one to go for. <laughs> oh, and there's this amazing moment where we see a uh, David R. White break the car window yes and it's so he wheels back and then there's a <laughs> shot of very clear inset of like a black guy's hand smashing <laughs> sugar glass <laughs> which means that there is cut footage somewhere that someone could find and send me of david r white tapping his knuckles all against the car window, shitting himself, screaming and falling asleep. <laughs> I need to... Ah! <laughs> So now it's time for another exciting straight chase with the same two cop cars before that apparently can't make left turns and whatnot. Yeah, can't do any left turns. They could keep pace with a Porsche 911, but they're now chasing this family station wagon and have trouble yeah. keeping up with it. It's incredible. How quick is this car? Unbelievable. But again, because they can't even like do a sharp turn with these cars because they borrowed them from someone's dad who owns a dealership. <laughs> the way they get out is, oh, hey, look, a hitchhiker. Yeah. But I don't even understand how we get to the hitchhiker because they're driving and then there's like a weird transition where they mix the scenes and the cop car was right behind them at the, at the first scene and now in the second kind of scene, there's a bit of the mix. They stop the hitchhiker and there's like 40 seconds go by before the yes. cops. And I thought, like, have the cops just given up? Is that what it... Because now they can pull that <laughs> and the cops aren't going to ram right in the back of them. Where the fuck have these cops gone? Yeah, right. No, exactly. You're, you've you already escaped, guys. Um, so, yeah, they pick up the hitchhiker and they're like, fuck, the cops are going to come by and see us. But the cops drive by and they can't see him at all because the hitchhiker has Jesus powers. 
Is that what it okay. was? Jesus powers? Because he's dressed in a long, like, brown robe. He looks exactly like Obi-Wan. And now he just mind tricks the police. So thought, These are not the shit actors you're looking for. And then the cop goes to him. And now... The Ginsu knife salesman says, you can even cut a film with it. And suddenly we're in a table in a house holding our necks, drilled shopping online for a fucking neck brace and calling a personal injury lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we have to point out, there are, at the point here, there are about 33 minutes left in this hour and 45 minute movie. <laughs> and the rest of this movie happens like an Italian run through of a high school play. Just like, <laughs> giant swaths of explanation cut out with characters just running in and being like, oh my gosh, I'm here, here, I'm a red microchip. Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> just even this, this one scene transition pissed me off no end. My, my notes get super angry because my notes are, what the fuck just happened? Who is this person? What happened to the hitchhiker? How can a movie that's taken this long for anything to happen now just jump like this? Did yeah. I pass out and miss something? <laughs> that's my notes. <laughs> it's so good. Oh my God, they're sitting around suddenly with this woman uh, there, it, who wants to take him to Prodigal City. Where is that? Who is she? You, fuck you. Fuck you. Fuck you got you. an hour and 15 minutes of Stephen Baldwin reading the walls of his basement. You should be happy. <laughs> and now we cut to the, the van full of bad guys who couldn't more clearly be bad guys if the words were emblazoned on them like a political cartoon. <laughs> <laughs> it's so good. <laughs> it is literally just the villains of this movie are like, well, we're also here. Yeah, End of yeah. scene. <laughs> and the, the villains. It, this, I don't even have notes for this scene by this point because my notes were just dot, dot, dot because there's nothing to say about this scene. You've got villains in a van, you've got Caliban, you've got a uh, fake Trinity lady, and you've got a guy who's halfway between the Terminator and a blonde Neil. And that's what, what this scene actually is. And what's amazing is, so now we're back into the basement thing and David R. White can't wait to get away from the underground <laughs> railroad where he is. Yeah. But what's some, and he's like chatting up the softcore porn star who I'm going to Google immediately after doing this <laughs> recording and have some time for myself. Um, <laughs> but he's chatting up this girl. And what's amazing is all of Marsh's notes, because he hasn't watched 97 of these movies, is just like, what is happening? Where am I? Help me. Yeah, I had, where is this place? Please tell us, David, Negan, anyone, what has happened? What is going on? Who is this girl? We have no clue. <laughs> That's amazing. Uh, yeah, and... I, I, apparently this movie is a love story about David A.R. White and this girl that we haven't even given a name yet because now we're going to spend a good 15 minutes with the two of them flirting. <laughs> and But it's, oh man, does she kill a boner? She's like, she's like, my name's Rahab. And he's like, Rahab, what kind of name is that? And she's like, well, I used to call myself Cinnamon Sunshine because I used to be a prostitute. Yeah, and when she was a prostitute, she used to go by names that made her sound like a breakfast cereal. You know, cinnamon sunshine. <laughs> At one other point, she was called Golden Wheat Flakes. And for a while, I'm pretty sure for a while, she was a goth dominatrix called Countess Jocula. <laughs> I hope she was. I really hope she was. Right, and to David's credit, he reacts to a prostitute the way I do, which is like, oh, awesome, that is great. I need to hit an ATM. Um, <laughs> So many 20s. I'm so sorry. I would have gone to the bank. but uh, And she's like, no, no, no. I'm, uh, I'm into Jesus now. Yeah. Yeah. No, you'd have to marry me to fuck. He's like, oh, never mind. Yeah. And <laughs> David Iwai reacts to the idea of getting married the same way I used to. <laughs> and then he kind of laughs and goes like, what? What, seriously? <laughs> oh, man. It's such a construct, though, when you think like, what it is. <laughs> Labels are so crazy. I'm 35. <laughs> He's not here. Keep going. Keep going. Um, and now is the time on Sprockets when we fight, apparently. Oh, God. <laughs> because just out of fucking nowhere, now there's a fight going on. I right? okay. don't know why they're beating him up. I don't, they they I wanted see, Negan to, to break out of I, prison. That was he broke the, out of prison, <laughs> and now they're beating him up for it. I don't know what's happening. Yeah, so, okay, just to fill you in a little bit, 
Um, the wife has come. She just showed up all of a sudden at this basement that they were at. And she's like, hey, we need to talk. And he's like, yeah, they're probably going to wonder why you're in their basement. Um, so he wanders out with her. And now we cut to them and just out of fucking nowhere without establishing this shot or this scene or anything. He's in a fight with the giant half Neo, half Terminator guy um, who apparently fights also like the Terminator. He had the, the, they do the wall push Arnold Schwarzenegger fight. <laughs> and he, so he wins, right? And then um, Caliban, the bald guy, who's me now, basically, <laughs> he goes up and he's supposed to be choking him to threaten him. But <laughs> the actor is not holding his hand in a choking gesture. His no. hand, he looks like... He's doing like the five hearted palm exploding heart attack <laughs> on, his, on his neck. Like there was obviously clearly a moment where he was like, ah, oh, I'll choke you. And Negan was like, don't fucking touch me. And he's like, oh, sorry, sorry. Also, um, bald guy torture dude, um, the white makeup that they have for him stops right at his fucking yes! shit. Because his yeah. neck yeah, it's incredible. is normal. It's color. amazing. It's so good. <laughs> I'm a head albino. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I love this scene too. Like, cause again, like this movie has no idea what's going on in itself. First, we spend like 15 minutes with the fucking um, uh, Caliban telling the other guy, like, oh no, this bad guy is one of those mutantly genetically modified freak characters that we're going to introduce into this movie at this moment and will never come back. You know, like, yeah, like we're no, going to spend up all this time explaining to you why this guy would be a really tough guy to fight if you should have to fight him in Act 3. Don't worry, you won't. Yeah, nope. no, it's incredible. It's so <laughs> ridiculous. <laughs> I thought I had my notes originally, like, they're all mutants. Wow, it's going to be X Men. Nope, doesn't come back. Doesn't come back. At all. Nope. Not useful. <laughs> yeah. So, and I, I love to because they go eventually. They, they after they choke him out or whatever, they go. Why should tell me one reason why I shouldn't kill you right now? And he's like, because I'm going to kill the guy that you put me in prison to break out of prison to kill. And they're like, fuck, right, yeah, right. Give me one sit, reason not I... to kill you because uh, I'm carrying out the plan pretty much to the letter. <laughs> so... This makes no sense. <laughs> oh, right. Sorry. Oof. <laughs> um. How you doing? I'm not great. <laughs> All right. Um, I just figured we were both in this alley. Maybe we could get a coffee. <laughs> uh, and since we were also worried about how things were going with Davy and Rahab, we go back to that. Jesus. <laughs> and it, and again, this is just characters running forward and saying things that will never matter. Because this is where David R. White is like, I was married and my wife died. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, you were married before. That's how the scene starts, by the way. You were married before. Yeah, and I thought, what did he? What did he say before that? Because we weren't talking about him being married before. So no. why we we just cut out one line? Like, if the idea was she said, "I'll only fuck you if we get married," there was a line that we've missed, and now she's saying you were married before. What was his line that got from yeah, that no, point I, to that point? I, I bet he said something like, "Look, we both know that marriage doesn't make sex happen." And she was like, "Oh, you were married before." I <laughs> <laughs> See, I, I took it a different way. She's like, you were married before, and I wanted him to go like, shit, not a lot of people know this, but I'm the fucking narrator. I know, it seems like this movie's about Tom or Stephen Baldwin or something. Like, no, me, if you could believe it. <laughs> also, by the way, suddenly there's like 113 people in this basement with him. Were they here the whole time? No idea. No idea. It's ridiculous. Uh, and he explains right. his plan as well, how, they, how he's got the prodigal city. But he says, I'm taking Tom and Jerry to the prodigal city. And I thought, hang on, they're going with Tom and Jerry. They could have picked any yes. other names but Tom and Jerry. I mean, I Here's a quick example. You could have gone John and Terry. You barely even have to change the script to get to John and Terry. And you don't sound like a cartoon. I, never, I did not realize that. That's so goddamn funny. It's oh. actually the team in this movie. Yeah. And there's a great line where he says about Jerry as well. He says, um, God will look after Jerry. And I wrote, yeah, plus he's got Daddy Warbucks looking after him as well. So he'll just work out as well. And the music in the background, there is no way the piano track in the background is not called Dead Girlfriend Story. There's no way that's not the title of that track. Um, and then, okay, so Jerry cut, brings this scene to a close by coming in to tell them nothing. All right, here's what happens. <laughs> Davy and Ray are sitting there. Jerry comes in. He says, hey, we're going to leave when I'm done with this thing. And it's like, of course, we're going to leave when you're done with the thing. Why would you like, hey, Eli, when we're done reviewing this movie, I'm going to close the Zencaster window. 
We're talking and then through thirty more seconds of shots. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, they do that a lot in this movie, right? The like the camera just seems to linger there. Like, uh, somebody gonna say cut? Is somebody gonna? <laughs> we're just we're just okay. Um, and now we're reprogramming the marks of the beast. But we're also reprogramming the plot of the movie. This is <laughs> really yeah, yeah, very much so. This is where we learn that Tom is still in love with his ex-wife, and he would like to take out the satellite network because it would bring her back to normal. What satellite network? Fuck you. Go fuck <laughs> yourself. Why would you think there would be an answer to that? Oh, Jesus Christ. The other thing, one of my absolute pet hits in any film is uh, when someone's operating a computer and it needs to make loads of sound effects. Like whenever we sort of type on a laptop, obviously right now I'm using a computer, so it's making a, a whole lot of beats and words. <laughs> and as they're reprogramming these fucking chips, you hear the sound of a ZX Spectrum loading. It's like... Burr, 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 burr. And I thought either it's that's the noise of reprogramming the chips or like Tom just got bored and he's playing Manic Minor while he's waiting. <laughs> <laughs> it's just incredible. <laughs> oh. oh, Jesus. So, yeah. And then all of a sudden, out of fucking nowhere, he's like, yeah, but the chips also, they, they, they change your personality from the satellites. And Tom's like, well, what if we took out all the satellites? And he's like, well, that would be a completely different plot for a different movie, I would think. That would be almost like part two, wouldn't it, yeah, at this point? You're looking at the, the time, and there's like 20 minutes left. You know, you're not going to take out the satellites in 20 minutes. Come on, be realistic. Let's just kill no. Cohen and get it over with. Maybe we could bring it to a close that way. <laughs> also, we need one more scene with Rahab, or she wouldn't blow the director. So we get that. And then we head to the <laughs> swamp. Yep. Lake. Here. Lake thing. swamp. They're escaping via airboat. I, who the, <laughs> where are... And the hitchhiker is here again. He's back! And, they're, and now they're back. all in robes. They're all in Jedi outfits, yeah, too. But what? nobody refers to the hitchhiker. It's like, can, can only I see him? What is going on here? Am I the only one? Why don't... And the, the hitchhiker just slowly, silently points to the boat that's going to let them across the river like he's the fucking Grim Reaper. And I, at this point, I had a fan theory that this river was the River Styx, and they all died in that car accident way back when they were in a, in a police chase. And that's what's going on. They're now being pointed across the river by the Grim Reaper. It's the only thing that makes sense. Yeah, no, it certainly makes more sense than what they were going for. Um, So, yeah, they're getting on the boat to go escape or whatever. But now we have to go back to the hidey hole basement with all the Christians where Rahab was um, so the bad guys can come in and murder all of them. But which I, I think they don't need to murder them because as you cut around this Christian bunker, there is no chance these people are not about to mass suicide. You look at them, they are <laughs> one, they're, they're, they're pouring the Kool-Aid out as, the, as the, the bad guys come in and shoot them all. <laughs> and I want to point out that at this point, Rahab gets killed. So this character that we just spent 15 minutes with setting up as the love interest for David A.R. White just gets killed in the next scene. We're done with her now. Yeah, and there's no way she's not regretting giving up her life of being a prostitute. God, right. She, she, she wishes she still carried on the sinful ways, blowing guys for money under her pseudonym, presumably Honey Smacks, or, or whatever she <laughs> is. Lucky charms. You have a lot of serial-based <laughs> prostitute names. Well done. Well, I, I'll point out, that's not even a serial in the UK. I had to Google American serials just to get that true. <laughs> Dedication, goddammit. <laughs> Think about how weird our collective Google history is. <laughs> uh, anyway, I all got right. Bookmarks. So, I don't Google. <laughs> so luckily the good guys are fine. Um and they're motorboating away, but not in a boobs kind of way. Uh <laughs> they're going up river to get to Prodigal City. But Tom just can't help but thinking about downing all those satellites from the last <laughs> scene. And we literally watch him hijack the plot. Like, <laughs> literally hijack the plot. He does. The movie he does. Is, is headed towards its plot. And Tom's like, nope, the movie's about something different now. <laughs> I, I hope I hope that happened live. And they decided to roll with it. The actor just started deciding this one's to be about satellites. And, that, and I hope somewhere he gets a writing credit for actually rechanging the plot of this film. <laughs> Oh, it's so yeah, infuriating. Right. Okay, but before we get to him uh, uh, literally hijacking the boat that is taking the plot to the next plot point and going back to where it came from, um, we have to talk about the quantum conversation they have here. <laughs> oh, God. 
This is amazing. This is every episode of Be Reasonable, but set on a boat. <laughs> <laughs> I, I really wanted it to cut over to Marsh and Marsh to just be going, mm. now, do you think, do you think, here's a question that a lot of listeners might have. A lot of listeners might have, not me, of course, because I'm on your side. A lot of listeners might wonder, what if AIDS wasn't caused by a bat flying in your window every night and sniffling dust over you? What do you say to people who say that? Mm. Mm. Mm, I'm I should not stop giving you yes advanced previews of agreement. upcoming shows, Eli. I should stop sending you the show. The <laughs> so here's the thing. The satellites work on a quantum computer system because that's a real thing. They're pretty sure. Um, so you would need a quantum computer to communicate with it, which means by necessity that their chips are quantum computers. <laughs> right? Because they communicate yeah. anyway. So, but nobody wants to help with this plan because where would you find a quantum computer if you're walking around wearing one in your hand all the time? <laughs> uh, and, but, and I love to, okay, because David A.R. White and, and Jerry are, are saying, oh, you know, here's a practical reason why that wouldn't work. Here's a practical reason that wouldn't work. And the hitchhiker guy that's taking them down the boat just says, no, that kind of fucks up our Jesus story. So, no, that won't work. Thing is, that's not even the hitchhiker. That's just the guy who drives the boat. This is just a random guy we've never seen who still interjects oh, in the plot to tell them that their plan won't work. It's, it's incredible. Jesus Christ. And at this point, someone he says as well, your beliefs are irrelevant to facts. And I wrote, yeah, this movie is saying, your, but this Christian movie is saying, your beliefs are irrelevant to facts. Unfucking real. Um, also, this is where he admits to the other guys that he was an assassin hired to kill Elijah Cohen. He <laughs> has nothing to gain by freely offering this information up. No. Nope. Well, he's he's killing that plot, so he should know <laughs> before he snaps its neck. I think it throws it over the side of the boat. This random motorboat driver as well, who we've never seen before, who seems to know a weird amount about their plan, even though he's never met these guys before. He's suddenly very relaxed about finding out that he's sat right next to an assassin. He's very, very <laughs> chill about that. And it comes back to bite him when that he immediately gets assassinated. <laughs> yes. him out. But we're coming up to one of my favorite moments of the movie. We're coming up to one of my oh, favorite moments yes. of the movie. All right. So they, <laughs> so they head back. The bad guy van is still out hunting for him. Um, and genetically modified blonde bad guy is sniffing them out. Yep. <laughs> And there's, there's an incredible moment as well. Uh, it made it. me genuinely laugh out loud where the bad guy is saying, yeah, they took a board. We're going to need to need to get a board. And then he immediately goes, wait, they're here. And it's just <laughs> that transition. It's just such a, it comes so close together. It's amazing. I cried with laughter. I cried with laughter because it truly is. We're going to need a boat. Nope, never mind. <laughs> Fuck it. I wasn't smelling far enough into the future just that. Uh, yeah. And and he gets shot. Okay, so this is the character that we've set up as a genetically modified super soldier with extra power, sensory powers and everything. He just gets shot in the head and dies now. Yeah, bang, done. He's That's gone. it. We're done with him. Uh, the blonde, the, the, the bald guy, the torture guy, he also gets shot. Everybody with the ex-wife gets shot. And we're like, oh, I guess... That's why we introduced other bad guys. <laughs> well, let's talk about how crazy the shooting thing is, because it's like, boop, oh, Terminator guy gets shot, and they shoot into the bushes where the shot came from. And then bald guy gets shot, and they shoot into the bushes <laughs> where the shooting came from. And then he walks out, and <laughs> he's just got David R. White in front of him. For some reason, the, like, the bullets didn't kill them in the bushes because David R. White was standing in front of <laughs> him. <laughs> Yeah, and, and why is he Who holding David in knows? front of him when his ex-wife is trying to shoot them? She doesn't give a fuck about that guy. If she wants them dead, she'll kill him. <laughs> she does not care at right. all. It, oh, God, it's incredible. Well, and they have the moment, too, like with him and the ex-wife where she's like, you won't kill me. And she's like, you won't kill me. No, you, no, you. And so she starts to do the slow squeeze, the movie slow trigger squeeze. Yeah, and at this point, David R. White teleports over to her I, to stop because he, they are miles away from each other but he somehow diverts a gun in the time it takes her to pull the trigger it's just like boom he just zaps in it's amazing yeah he uses the i'll grab your gun arm technique um and takes the gun now he's about to shoot her but uh, uh tom is like no you can't shoot my ex-wife or i'll shoot you and he's like oh god damn it um and what then they this drive movie about <laughs> i don't know <laughs> There's Why like 18 are we minutes her? left. There's no reason to take her. There's none. <laughs> no, and they uh. almost, because we head over to Evil Plex here, they almost give them a reason why she's 
part of it because like she's going to try to break them in. But like they, they get to the guard and she's, he's like, well, yeah, you can go in, but they're not cleared. And then so just Tom pulls out a gun and says, now we can go in. And he's like, yeah, OK, you can go in. Like, then yeah. I guess you didn't need her. Yeah, waste of time, complete anyway. waste of time. We have to talk about the guard, though, because the guard has the mark yes. on his forehead. <laughs> oh, yes, yeah. Uh, one. He's the first one, one we've he's, seen. Yeah, exactly. And I want to think that he got the mark before all of his friends, and then he saw his friends, and he's like, oh, guys, you went for the hand. We said we were going to get the hand. <laughs> no, going to get the head. I look like a dick now. I've got the head. Why didn't you tell me? But I don't even know how he scans his head. Because well, you, you can put your hand under like a barcode scanner. Is he is he bending down? Does he have a do they have special uh, a separate scanner at like six foot high for him to sort of like walk up? To? It makes no. It's all hugely impractical. You want a standardized system? <laughs> God damn it! Yeah. So they go into the uh, the main computer brain hacking data room thing, and this is where we meet disappearing computer guy. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Disappearing computer guy is very clearly looking at porn when they walk yes. in. Yes. Because they walk in and he like he shuts the monitor down and like takes a zip disc out and tears it into pieces. He's like, hey guys, what's up? What's what's go what's hey? Why are hey, you hey, hey what's crazy? Uh, I got a oh, cold. Wait, Need you're tissues. not supposed to <laughs> So, yeah, and they say, patch us on into the satellite uplink. And he's like, that's impossible. Those words don't even make sense. And they're like, I have a gun. And he's like, now they make sense. <laughs> but, okay, but he takes him over to the satellite uplink. He's like, I need the hacking numbers. And he's like, six. Okay. <laughs> Just yeah, put in your password. And he's like, okay, I won't have to move my hand around the keyboard for that at all, no. will I? He's, he's just hackity hack hacking. <laughs> Honestly, the guy might hold his hands like an inch or two above the keyboard and be like, clickety click, 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 <laughs> click, and click, click, click. There's a point in a little bit where, where Jerry, we see him from the side, and Jerry at this point is worth pointing out, is redder than ever. This is starting oh, to get yes. weird. And nobody notices it. No one seems to care <laughs> that Jerry just keeps stopping off on this uh, plot to try and bring down the uh, the New World Order just to dye his hair a bit more because he's, he's, he's worried that his <laughs> roots are coming through. The but we see him from the side, and he's very <laughs> clearly just hitting the same six keys on the middle line. Yes. That's, that's all he's doing. It's like F, K, DJ. <laughs> FKDJH. No, that wasn't it. I'll try a different combination of those same keys. Luckily, they keep quantum computers on a home row system. Yeah. And we also have to explore the why the fuck are we doing this moment of the uh, of the movie where he has to explain to his wife that the reason he's doing this is so that the satellite can get shut down and her chip will stop making her not love him anymore and they'll be happy together again. Right. And she like she like lashes out at him like they're having a fight. Yeah, mid middle like, of a little hacking thing, the, the big finale. We need a couple like, fight. I never loved you, and he's like, "Don't do this, not in front of Jerry." Don't <laughs> let <laughs> him. He, he blames, the microchip talking. Yeah, he blames the chip, and uh, I think the problem isn't the chip on her hand; it's the chip on her shoulder. Am I right? Boom. Oh shit! Oh, yeah. <laughs> what I love during this emotional conversation as well is it's totally undermined by the constant beeping and whirring of the computer as Jerry's trying to hack it. And I was just thinking, can't you hit mute? Like, why? Why does that computer <laughs> even need speakers? Why would you need to put speakers on that? Why do you need to put speakers on a mainframe? It makes no. Just turn them off. Turn the sound off, Jerry. <laughs> I love to at one point Jerry goes like I have no clue what I'm doing here guys and I'm like yeah no we can tell because you're only getting those eight keys bro yeah. press H faster just keep pressing H faster honestly I swear it'll work he yells just for no reason he goes so much redundancy like secular podcasting <laughs> yeah, and he says there's just security all over the place what does that mean what does what? that mean there's just, it's just covered in security <laughs> <laughs> but in the end, he can't quite bring down the satellite thing. So the bad guys come in all slow motion. -y. <laughs> and the bad guy comes in and he's like, I'm here. He does a slow clap. He walks into yes. a slow clap. Yes. And he's like, I'm here to make this movie about something else. Yeah, that, that plot's now dead. Yet another plot against the wall. Shut it <laughs> down. You almost had your hammer on that mold, didn't you? Yeah, so it's time for the protracted bad guy Mexican standoff monologue thing. And he's like, oh, I have no reason. Negan is like, I have no reason not to shoot you. So he starts to shoot you. But who should come in but Elijah Cohen? Oh, yeah. Oh, my Elijah God. Cohen. And I, we cannot 
overstate this moment of the movie, right? Like Negan goes to shoot him. He's like, hey, here's my contribution to history. I'm going to murder you in three, two, one. And then just then, literally, oh, <laughs> comes in and, and the, the a light flashes in the room. Um, and we hear, Thomas, stop. <laughs> and we turn over and this Elijah Cohen character is coming through an open door bathed in white light. Like there is, I had to, I literally laughed out loud, had to pause the movie and get a tissue and not for my eyes. <laughs> um, this was an amazing moment. This was the cheesiest moment in any David A.R. White movie. <laughs> also, the leader guy is blind now? Yes, the yeah, main... But, but not surprised at all by it. Like, no. the, the Elijah Cohen has blinded him, and the, the, the leader says, I can't see now. He's very relaxed <laughs> about the fact that he's been stricken blind. Yeah, um, and so Elijah turns to Tom and he says, even though everyone said your plan was doomed to fail, you kept trying anyway. That makes you jesus -y enough. Let's go. Yeah, let's just, let's just go. Let's just yep. go. Let's just leave all the satellites up. You're, leave everybody you're, else. You were, no, uh, we're not going to the, the Antichrist. This, let's just leave. I don't. The wife gone. Never yeah. in this movie again. No. Nope. Yeah. We, well, we will see her at the exit. Well, yeah. We're not spoiler. So okay. So we cut to Prodigal City, which is apparently 1880s town in South Dakota. Yeah, it's basically a lumberjack yard by the looks of <laughs> things. They're all wearing some of the checky shirts. They're cut in wood. It's it's old time. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And and Jerry is going to stay in Prodigal City, a place we have never seen before that we are only now learning about. But Dave and Tom, Dave's going to leave to join the revolution. And so is Tom. Yeah, oh, this is a revolution that we don't really know is a thing. We, we've not. No. Any, I don't know that we know there's a it, there is any kind of thing. And he specifically says, uh, yeah, Prodigal City. It's just not for me. And we can tell that because we've seen 1.75 seconds of Prodigal City up until this point. <laughs> now, that's all we've got to kind of expose. It. Oh, God. And so as bad. we're looking at it, we're going, this is so not Brody. Yeah. Yeah. And Jerry's hair is so red. It's fucking scarlet and no <laughs> one's mentioning it. And I thought I was going crazy. I thought this movie is gaslighting me. <laughs> And just because this movie refuses to be over, after we have the introductory Prodigal City sign, uh, scene, we cut to later, but in the same place. <laughs> <laughs> right? Because like at first they're making it, the, and then we cut, like, they're, they're making the stew, and then we cut to them having eaten the stew and doing the dishes. It's like, well, I was wondering what they would have eaten. <laughs> <laughs> and then they just leave. They just <laughs> leave. <laughs> Davey's like, yeah, these Christian girls don't fuck. You want to go? And he's like, yeah, apparently the movie's not over we should be moving or something <laughs> and somehow there's another fucking scene <laughs> there's several there's like i like as i you guys had already done done the notes you had already read watched the movie and shit so as i'm going through this i keep scrolling down and going he's got more scenes what the <laughs> fuck is going on here yeah this scene is the the end of the incredible hulk as uh david banner walks to another town scene that's that's what this right. bit is they're just walking down the deserted road dun, 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 dun. <laughs> but if it ended there maybe the scene would make sense but it doesn't so yes they have apparently reached the predetermined separate ways road so they 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 say their goodbyes but just as about uh, as they're about to leave a jeep drives up and damn it it torture troll it, it turns out that the caliban wasn't killed when he got shot with the big blonde guy earlier he's still alive and he's hunted them down somehow that How we don't did know he about find them who knows? We don't Go need to know fuck that. fuck yourself. And it makes me think, why didn't you check that he was dead? And what <laughs> happened in that shooting scene earlier? Terminator guy gets shot. Another shot rings out and Caliban just knows to drop to the ground. <laughs> thinking, I bet what happens. If I, if I play dead now, <laughs> in like a week or so, I'll be able to track them down and find them again. <laughs> Maybe that's how he finds them because he's Caliban. He can just track them. That's what Caliban does. Oh, it all yeah. makes sense. Uh. Yeah. No, yeah, right, exactly. Tom was a mutant the whole time. Um, and Okay, so now they're captured, and we cut to them being tortured. We're back in the Wonder Woman torture <laughs> chamber with the bracelets. And I, I love that Marsh tried to make this make sense. Yeah, I think it makes perfect <laughs> sense. It all comes back together. This whole movie so far has been one of the torture simulations. That's the explanation. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing's happened. So, okay, you didn't, you didn't like that confusing going around whack-a-mole plot thing. We'll go back to the broken glass one. It's fine. I, I know you preferred that one. <laughs> So, yeah, for six days, they've withstood the, chores, the torture, and now they have to make a choice between life and Jesus, and they choose Jesus. Well, Tom chooses Jesus. 
Which is fine, because we've already established at the start of this film that he'll say and do anything under torture. He says that very explicitly. <laughs> I'll do anything to make the torture stop. Do, tell me what you want me to do. So we already know that he can't stand up to torture, and that's why he's turning to Jesus. That's fine. That's fine. <laughs> Must be. And so the so message he's... of this film is that sometimes people need to be tortured into loving Jesus. That's the message this film is sending. <laughs> <this one. laughs> right, so Tom gets executed. Yep, he gets beheaded. He can see heaven opening and Jesus, Ray, beheading. And his ex-wife came to his execution like a school play. <laughs> yeah. Who <laughs> said it never comes to my executions? And that's still not it. No, no. This, this movie, like a decapitated head, keeps going for four minutes after it's dead. I don't understand. So now Jerry is doing a Bible study over flashbacks of the movie. <laughs> uh, and the thing is Jerry survives but he'd already accepted Jesus so I can't figure out if that makes him a better or a worse Christian than the, the guy who died for Jesus so is, is Tom or Jerry the, the better I have no idea I, this, this, who, we'll never know right yeah and so now we go all the way back to the beginning. Davey picks up his narration from the beginning remember how he liked Saturday morning cartoons and remembered them or, any, or whatever we're back there now again and it so it turns out that when they were getting tortured, he decided to take the implant after all, and his character is going to burn in hell for eternity in the end. So what we're seeing is that the characters that make the right choice got tortured uh, <laughs> for six days and beheaded. The guy who made the wrong choice has to have a two hundred year fuck party. Yeah, yeah, that's 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 where. They, and what I hate about this as well is the last line when he says, "The last choice I made." was the wrong choice. He delivers that straight down the barrel of the camera. Oh, yes. Straight to the audience. It's like, I'm talking to you guys. It's, it just takes all the fucking subtlety. None of the subtlety was there, and it still managed to bring <laughs> yes, more so subtlety awful. out. It gets into, oh, God, it's terrible. <laughs> all right. Well, we've gone a little long here, so we got to wrap up quick. So to close things off tonight, I simply ask you this. What is the worst Hollywood apocalypse that would be more fun to live through than this movie was to watch? Uh, I'm going to go the, with the one from This is the End because Aziz Ansari is dead. And that's a good world. The world where Aziz Ansari is dead. It's a good one. See, I, I'm not convinced there is an apocalypse that isn't worse than this. I think this sitting through this film, I think, was the apocalypse. I was 90% sure <laughs> I'd been put into one of those simulated torture machines. Uh, that, 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 that's what I think happened to me in this film. I'm going to wake up. Or at any second, my whole reality is going to switch back to me having broken glass shoved into my orifices. And I'm going to think, thank Christ that happened. Thank God for that. <laughs> at least now I can be beheaded. All right. Before we let you go, Marsh, if our listeners have decided that a couple hours with you just isn't enough, uh, where can they go for more Marsh? Oh, you can find me all over the place. I'm uh, Mr. M. Marsh on Twitter, or you can find uh, Be Reasonable to hear me being the complete opposite of how I've been for the last however long on this show. Uh, or Skeptics with a K is, uh, is my other podcast. So yeah, and come to QED as I mentioned at the start. Awesome. And of course, we'll have that all linked in the show notes, including information on QED. Uh, Marsh, thanks so much for suffering alongside us once again. It was an absolute pleasure, guys. And well, that does it for our review of Six the Mark Unleashed. That's not going to do it for the episode just yet because we still need to tighten your titties for next week. So, Eli, tell us what's on deck. Believe. At least this one's in color. Yeah, it's a heartwarming tale of a <laughs> a, a coal mining guy, a well, plant owner who shuts and the but the Jesus and the and the and a magical black kid, magic black child. Uh, looks real bad. Looks yeah, real bad. Christmas looks... bad <laughs> Yeah, it's apparently the whole thing is the 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 town's effort to save the Christian pageant despite all the poverty. Uh, yeah. All right. So with that to look forward to, we're going to bring episode 97 to a merciful close. Once again, a huge thanks to Michael Marshall for hanging out with us tonight. And an even huger thanks to all the Patreon donors that help make the show go. If you'd like to count yourself among their ranks, you can make a per episode donation at patreon.com slash godawful and thereby earn early access to an ad free version of every episode. You can also help us out a ton by leaving us a five star review on iTunes and by sharing the show on all your various social media platforms. And if you enjoyed this show, be sure to check out our sibling shows, The Scathing Atheist, The Skeptocrat, and Citation Needed, available on iTunes and all them other places where podcasts are. 
If you have questions, comments, or cinematic suggestions, you can email godawfulmovies at gmail.com. Legal services for this podcast are provided by the law offices of P. Andrew Torres. Our theme song was written and performed by Ryan Slotnick of Evil Giraffes on Mars. All other music was written and performed by our audio engineer, Morgan Clark, and was used with permission. Thanks again for giving us a chunk of your life this week. For Heath Thenwright, Mike Marshall, and Eli Bosnick, I'm Noah Illusions promising to work hard to earn another chunk next week. Until then, we'll leave you with the Breakfast Club close. This movie cheated us out of watching Joe get his head cut off, and Marsh will never be okay. David R. White changed his mind about the whole taking the mark thing once the group sex started. You think? <laughs> oh, oh, never mind. I'm fine with this. I'm actually, I always I really thought fine. butt stuff wouldn't feel, because it doesn't feel that good to poop. Nope. The preceding podcast was a production of Puzzle and a Thunderstorm, LLC. Copyright 2017. All rights reserved. Napa Know How. There are lots of amazing cars on the road, but perhaps none more amazing than the paid-off car. It may not be pretty, but the price is right. Heck, if you keep that thing running, it'll actually start paying you. Because with Napa Rewards, for every $100 you spend, you'll get $5 off. So keep your car running longer, stronger with Napa Rewards, and watch the savings start rolling in. That's Napa Know How. Napa Know How.